fast. Oke, okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning everyone. Welcome to the first uh, colloquium on photography and new media uh, education for your empowerment. So this is the last day and I hope that um, today's is fine will be um, memorable for all of you. I also want to say welcome to Surabaya. Welcome to Universitas Airlangga. It's very it's yes. Yeah. It's uh, We are very honored to have you here in our newest building. <laughs> It's a bit uh, show off. Yeah, this is the ASEEC uh, Tower. Yeah, and today uh, we have a very interesting discussion. We about the image and the new media. I guess this is the very important topic that we have that we face in various countries, and especially in Indonesia. We hope that our Two presenter today will give um, us uh, something to think about, yeah. Some or even to enhance our interest in uh, image and new media. Uh, the first speaker is um, Mr. Zaki Habibi, Mr. Z Dr. Zaki Habibi. Uh, Dr. Zaki Habibi is a media studies and visual culture researcher with main interest in the interrelation between everyday life and cultural practice in cities particularly on contemporary southeast southeast <laughs> asian urban cultures he holds a phd in media and communication studies from lund university sweden and his doctoral research uses a combination of ethnographic and photographic methods a preparation book entitled creative voices of the city and his other works have been published in academic journals and edited volumes including in reimagining creative cities in 21st century uh, asia um and mr zaki will uh, present a very interesting uh, material titled sensory and photography photo documentation photo elicitation and re-photography for investigating uh, social issues. So uh, from what we already know, but Mr. Zaki, if you have any interest uh, from whatever Mr. Zaki will uh, tell us later, uh, I suggest that you uh, you know, prepare the question. This is a very rare opportunity uh, for you, for the both students and the practical pra <coughs> practitioner. So uh, after this session, we will have the Q&A session with Mr. Zaki Habibi, yes. Uh, we can start maybe, eh, and uh, we can start with the first, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, um, maybe we should uh, introduce also the second speaker. Yeah, second speaker, uh, we have Miss Gaya Squarci, yeah, Miss Gaya, uh, okay, hello, <laughs> yeah, um, Miss Gaya Squarci is a photographer and videographer uh, who divides her time between Milan and New York, where she teaches digital storytelling at ICP. With a background in art history and photojournalism, she moves away from the descriptive narrative tradition in documentary. Her work is focused on theme link to the environment and family relationship. Gaya is a National Geographic Society uh, grantee and her project Ashes and Autumn Flowers was nominated for Prix Pictet. POWI awarded her photography and photography work respectively in 2014 and 2017. Clients include New York Times, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and others. So from this description, uh, you already know that we have a very outstanding speaker in, in our uh, the same room with us today. So make sure that you uh, listen too closely to whatever uh, both of our speakers uh, will tell. And um, I hope that we can have the discussion yeah, uh, today. 
Uh, so without much further ado, we can start the first uh, presentation from Mr. Zaki Habibi. So um, Mr. Zaki, you can start. Yeah. Biasanya dipanggil siapa? Pak Angga di sini. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the first global colloquium on photography and new media education for youth empowerment. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. And my name is Zaki. And allow me, Mas Angga. Um, I think I would rather to stand up since. The difference with the yesterday room, we are not in the theatrical room anymore. So if I sit there and I'm quite a lepetite, <laughs> right, Jerome? <laughs> so I'm a little bit small, so I, I'm, I'm afraid some of you might not see me there. So I'll be walking around. This is kind of like more semi-workshop thingy. So in that sense, what I'm going to say also uh, might be also follow interactively. And Good morning as well for those who are currently joining via Zoom. Welcome aboard. <laughs> so uh, in this sense, I'm going to, can I help you to share the screen? Boleh mas, sekarang? Sip. Oh, saya bisa tengok dari sini. Uh, in this occasion, uh, allow me as well to mix sometimes with English, sometimes with Bahasa Indonesia, especially for some term that might be not too familiar for all disciplines. Okay, uh, but it won't be a full translation. So it's just a matter of to make sure that everything that I'm going to talk about, it's not something that it's too vague. For those who are coming from communication, maybe it's clear enough, but at some point you get lost. For those coming from anthropology, you, you get lost in the beginning, but then you just realize, oh, that's something that I've been done before. Ah. So I want, well, no matter your background of discipline, of practices, uh, I have to move here also, because you're being stuck with this pillar. <laughs> Feel free to move. I think it's okay if you want to move a little bit. Let's make this uh, not as a boundary, but I, I don't think I can move too far, because the camera is over here. If not, then the Zoom participant will have. Okay. Uh, sensory and photography, photo documentation, photo elicitation, and re-photography for investigation social issue. I hope it works. Yes. Uh, let me start with where I begin. My standpoint, when I mention my standpoint, it's not just this formality of association, which is all my affiliation. I'm currently one foot in uh, Jogja, in Department of Communication, Universitas Islam Indonesia. The other foot is in Lund. It's a small town in the southern of Sweden. Uh, I used to live and work there. Uh, also in the Department of Communication and Media, dealing with the similar aspect as well. I'm currently hold my research affiliate. I used to uh, run as a former senior lecturer over there and currently as senior. Because I would love to, but I'm, I'm afraid since I cannot split my body <laughs> and we are still dealing with that. Next. I don't think so. Okay. This is where I stand point my, where I foreground my research and everything. Today I'm going to speak since we will have Gaia for talking more from more practitioner and uh, uh, I would say artist. <laughs> I myself, my disclaimer first, I'm not an artist. And I don't think I will be an artist at some point, <laughs> even though I try so hard. So I'm not an artist in the sense of photography art. Nope. Another disclaimer, I myself also not of professionally trained in photography. I'm professionally trained as a social and humanities uh, researcher. And my focus area is urban media and communication, including subfield of it, it's visual culture, including film studies, documentary studies, as well as other aspect on urban creativity in the last six year, dealing with how the ways in which creativity become part of our society and our environment and culture and how it actually impact our lives socially. However, whatever the list it looks like very long like that, 
it's also my limitation. I don't understand every single thing, even within the photography. So in that sense, I will invite all of you to also contribute in that sense that you have your own standpoint. Just change my the name on this, this slide. You have your own. Dari mana kawan-kawan ini berangkat pun, it's something. Because within photography in general, that's the thing that I'm going to focus on here in today in this morning talk. It's not just a matter on the technicalities. Of course, during the residency of the 12 student in Jiwa Jawa and uh, Padepoan Photography Bromo, Jerome, uh, Karin, and Aji, Anamas Aji, already helped really contribute in the uh, on the aspect of photography as a philosophical way to see the world. And then I would assume that would be some kind of on the aspect of technicalities, uh, uh, whether it's a basic or advanced, until how to see things in a visual storytelling, editing, curating, sequencing, right, and then and so on. While I will, uh, since it's already part of the discussion as well yesterday, I'm going to say from a, a slightly different angle, which is on the way we, oh yeah, Where do we begin? Uh, now it's come to you all. Uh, I would say it's from these two key concepts about self and about identity. But it's quite an abstract thing. Tentang diri dan tentang identitas. It seems simple. Let's try it out. I hope you have your own mobile phone now with you. No, you don't need to show to others. <laughs> I feel it's it's safe zone. Just take a look. Take a look your own mobile phone. Whether you have the internet connection or not, you definitely have the photo album or photo apps. Just take a look, take a look. Do this scroll down, scroll up. Take a look. Uh, first, take a look how many pictures you have in this album. Is it 12? Is it 120? Is it 1,200? Or is it, yeah. This information just for you. You don't need to share. Just take a look. Now you just realize how many images you have. Do you have video? No, uh, it's okay if you are tuna pulsa, ya, nggak apa-apa. Ini nggak butuh full ke, uh, kuota. <laughs> Udah? Uh, have you seen that? Now ask yourself, what do you see in general in your own photo apps? Now you just realize that so many things. What do you see? Is there any specific pattern? Are there only selfies? Or are they selfies but by others? <laughs> are they group selfie that mostly you don't know the people? Why I save this? Take a look, take a look. Or most of the time it's basically just screenshot, quote and quote. Because just it might be anything. Screenshot of A, screenshot of announcement, screenshot of anything. And then you just realize, why on earth I save this, right? Now you you now I know you are busy now deleting some of the pictures because you just realized okay I don't need this I don't need that I don't need this, right? S next level for the question. Now ask yourself more uh, on yeah we call it more ontological or more on the aspect of being of why I have this and now it's the materiality that you face. If we call it as a photographic practice, I put in bracket the photographic because it might be debatable. Uh, but then, what kind of practices that make you end up to save such a collection? Were you really active to take a picture? Were you really active to move the camera into the front camera? Would you actually never have or rarely do that because mostly it's a screenshot? So what kind of, after that, what kind of feeling? Because after practices, practices about question of what exactly we do, the doing, while experience is about what exactly we feel while doing it or after doing that. Okay, this is a little practices you can share with your friend, but you just realize the question, the very question of self is actually represented somehow in this particular album. Is that so or not? Or maybe you question yourself too now. No. I'm not really happy with this, why I, I collect it. Okay, this question is an open question. You, it's not a quiz, you, so you don't need to answer it right away as a solid answer. But when we reflect upon our daily practice, 
which is nowadays it's the device that really attached to our body, which is our mobile phone, we just realize it's a window to see the self. It might be personal identity at this point, but if you collect more information, ask your friend, see other friends, if it is uh, the friend giving a consent on that, then you see a collective identity, because then you take a look on the same badge in the same department of your peer, then take a look in your family member, your father, your mother, your siblings. Now you have this kind of familial identity. Now expand the horizon into broader. As long as you don't ask in the bus, hey, can you scroll down? I want to see. <laughs> it's already become another uh, more social aspect. Just from this tiny. In the academic research, it's called go along method. You go along with your subject, take a look of their phone sometimes or whatever the device. The device is not really important. Maybe laptop, maybe this. Then you go along with the story about the pictures and then beneath that you see not only representation, you see practices, you see experience, you see things. So that kind of photography that actually might lead you to see a broader and a bigger issue, not just individually but also socially. Okay, uh, this is just a, 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 a tiny practice that you can also explore further. You can also modify it. Next one. You can also modify the the image or the activity with many other modification. Now I take you to a more, a little bit more abstract journey, but it's quite a good. Uh, apologies for those who are the expert in this room. Sorry, I cannot avoid not to talk Roland Bart in this <laughs> camera lucida. Uh, but it's still relevant, I think, and for the student. Uh, this is his latest book published, uh, I think, uh, even after he passed away with the tragic accident being hit and run by a scooter or a car. Bicycle, even. Okay, sorry, Bart, your life is so <laughs> great. But then, but this, this is the very uh, book in his academic and also intellectual career that actually dedicated specifically, specifically the whole book for photography. Not on the technical aspect, of course, not even on the social impact or representation, but on the reflexive aspect. It's a very tiny book, thin one, but to me it took 20 years and still reread again and reread again to understand it. And one of the quote here that I took, the two ways of the photograph, he used P, the photograph with the capital P, jadi dia tulisnya pun dengan huruf capital P, because it also show the important aspect. It's not just the saying. Jadi pilihannya menjadi buat saya adalah subjek-subjek yang kemudian menjadi telaah penglihatan. I'm trying here to uh, uh, unearth the the quite abstract thing into bahasa Indonesia uh, yang kemudian kita mau membuat ko menjadi semacam kode-kode yang seperti ilusi perfect ilusi sempurna kita itulah fotografi buat kita yesterday we had an, we had a presentation I forgot Mas Angga who mentioned about what we mean by beautiful photograph so, ya kan apa yang kita pahami dengan foto-foto yang indah Nah, atau, or to confront in the awakening of intractable reality. Realitas yang sebenarnya nggak bisa kita kontrol, nggak bisa kita kendalikan. Dalam empat baris ini, atau di buku itu hanya dua baris, kalimat ini sebenarnya maknanya luas sekali dan bisa di-expand. We can use this kind of uh, simple statement, but no longer simple, I would say. And even this book originally published, uh, of course, since I don't speak uh, France, uh, I read the English version, which is published in 1980. Uh, so it's still quite relevant after that, philosophically speaking, and also theoretically afterward. And somehow, this is the focus then of my talk, inform the approach or methodological one. Jadi fotografi ternyata nggak sesederhana. Take a picture, who's the person behind the lens, Sh press the shutter, or now press your thumb. <laughs> That's how you the practice, right? Press your thumb. And next one. So beyond its technicalities, let's take a look about 
how actually photography can be understood from a different angle, I propose the framework of critical visual methodologies. If we look upon photography as a part of an approach, photography for expressing emotion as the art, photography for telling the information as in photojournalism, the photojournalistic, kan begitu, untuk melaporkan warta. Photography as uh, the way to dig deeper the social problem, as in social documentary. Photography for actually uh, attract people. Uh, so prob finding the problem solving of a particular issue in a particular uh, community. Uh, it's like a socially engaged photography, atau participatory photography. Now, whatever the, the technical aspect, uh, I'm, I would rather to see it as a kind of a critical visual methodologies. By critical, it's not just that we take a picture, come to the place, we go out from there. We, we just realize there are many things l in layers beneath the thing that we took, beneath the subject that we talk to, beneath the interaction between we as the person who took the pictures, those who are being photographed, as Roland Bat say, or the interaction as well as the image itself. So many layers. So while at the same time everyone knows that now it sounds cliche, pictures says many things. Yeah, in which way? It's it's too chaotic if we don't continue that question. Indeed, viewers make meaning. While at the same time, the mediated and situated truth in and through photography can be questioned, re-questioned, and re program or reconstructed as as well especially i'm talking now in 2023 when the devices whatever the name is and the technicalities is in people's everyday life it's no longer just the privilege of so-called professional photography or intellectual photographer and so on so this is just few examples oh when when I put some visual illustration within the slide, it's also in the intention to give you for more reference or further reading if you think it's quite uh, uh, important for your own work. Okay, now jump to uh, step by step of my offer. Of course, in this, saya masih punya berapa menit mas? Twenty minute. Okay, in the next twenty minute, it's it's possible. I think Gaya also agree with me. It's pos impossible to say in 30 minutes the whole possible approach that we are going to approach. So uh, strategically, I am going to uh, offer this three uh, possible approach. Some of you might already done it. Some of you already done it, but don't realize the name of it. <laughs> some of you might be, uh, it is a new thing. So I'm going to share some three approach. And what is actually the red thread of it, this approach? The red thread, first, the previous slide, that we don't see photography as simple as a technical it is. Second, it's also beyond this artistic and aesthetic aspect. So one of the approach it's called photo documentation. By the word documentation, dokumentasi, untuk teman-teman di Indonesia harus dibedakan dengan seksi dokumentasi wedding, seksi dokumentasi apa panitia, ya kan? However, when it comes to the technicalities, it's actually the same. Only we started with a question. Before you took the pictures, we create the question. Sorry, Mas, ya, kameranya pusing, dia ngejar saya. Hilang di zoom, gak apa-apa. Nah, kasihan yang di situ ketutupan. Oke, okay, so photo documentation is about looking at photography. Still, still, this is quite the starting point as an evidence of so-called reality. But not in the objective way, of course. No, we don't talk about the area anymore. So everything is constructed, represented, uh, uh, and also questioned. But see, camera, mobile phone, uh, analog camera, digital camera, large view camera, uh, AI-based camera, whatever the device you use, if you use this approach on photo documentation, is actually a tool to do a collection of data that you've done in strategic way, in structure way, and starting with question. Untuk teman-teman mahasiswa, question ini yang kadang kalau dosen-dosen metopen bilangnya, rumusan masalahnya apa? Gitu lah, ya kan? 
Sorry, this joke is cannot be translated. This is a very student joke. Sorry. If I translate it into English, it won't be that funny. Rumusan masalahnya apa? Mana gap-nya? Gap-nya mana ini? Gap-nya. Usually it's a question when the student struggling to find the the gap within their design, research design. And it's been usually they spend not just in the one semester, yeah, the whole the whole journey of the study. Keep looking for the gap. So, similar with that kind, but of course it's more fun. Don't worry, I guarantee you. You in you try to 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 find the gap of the issue and everything, but to answer that gap, methodologically speaking, you use the photography. So how's the technicality? Uh, it it's not just in the sense that I'm I'm giving you a case study. Now it's getting more beyond the abstracting. This is coming from a case study that I did specifically in in the case. Can you see the uh, the name of the city? It's quite tiny above. So after this, that will be a reference on the place. Uh, every time there is a case study. This one is coming from Georgetown. Anyone been to Penang? Pulau Pinang, Malaysia. It's outside of the main island of Malaysia, close to the border with Thailand. It, uh, for 500 years, it's the hub for the British uh, colonial uh, structure for the control, the trading, as well as how and to whom this area. Of course, using the colonial eye, this is the area of the dirt, this is that the area from the beach, but we settled down here for the trading in Penang. Even the name, Georgetown, is actually also dedicated from the King George at the time in eight, uh, 1700, also made by the British uh, settlement. However, after 500 years, this small island is actually a melting pot of anywhere, a anyone in the world. There is a people coming from so this Asia, that Malay, there's also Chinese Malay, there's also Cantonese uh, chi Chinese, and also Hokkien, Hakka, uh, mostly Hokkien and Cantonese, Hakka some a little bit, and then there will be also European, and also Eurasia, those European who already getting married with local, they're not accepted back in the uh, uh, Europe after the World War II, but they cannot also mingle with that. So after that, in 2008, 2009, the city applied for UNESCO World Heritage Site. And they got it, along with Melaka, bersama dengan Malaka. But as any UNESCO inscribed inscription, it has a huge responsibility. To maintain that inscription, the city has to maintain this, the idea of heritage. Here comes the problem. How to maintain the issue on heritage that has been built organically, of course, with the colonial history, tension, problem, racial issue, but they maintain that in within 500 years, and suddenly they have to maintain that in, in five years. Because every five years, UNESCO will take a look and review the inscription. So the approach come from the creative angle. The Penang Tourism Board, the the even the national federal of malaysia government invite artists photographer filmmaker they create an event called georgetown festival every july and august usually july and august which is that actually also still on the european gaze because that's during the summertime <laughs> and when people come of course tourism is one way to boost the economy one way to boost but what make them stay reading the history of 500 years touching this the wall and understand how painful the city nope of course they want to see mural they want to see film projection video mapping project which is good the city never had experienced that before the problem come is it as harmonious as it is or are there any tension so i as a researcher come photographer also try to use the photo documentation approach to understand that layer of tension Collecting in detail in five years, I'm, uh, I use the strategy on back and forth because I myself not trained as an anthropologist. If you are an anthropologist, maybe you have the chance to stay there in a quite a long uh, period of time. In my strategy, I came there every year, stay there for months, and then return back to Sweden, and then coming back again. Within that time frame, I continue the photo documentation digitally. According to Paul Frost, published his book in 2019, screenshot. It's also a photograph. 
because it's also the way we see wool, just like your collection earlier. So that's my strategy. So within five years, basically I did that photo documentation approach. And even though on the street I can collect this, but it's beyond the photograph of the image. I also found out using my data, of course, after 4,000 something of photography, oh yeah, photo documentation end up with a pile of photos. <laughs> with a pile of photos. It's not about the aesthetic, it's not about that, but it's about the evidence and data. Every corner of the street, uh, I use this question of UNESCO create this buffer zone, just like in Borobudur, Pulau Komodo, they have the buffer zone, and then they have the core zone in the middle, and then two kilometers the buffer zone, and then the tree. So the way I structure my f walk, my the way I took the photograph, it's by structuring that, because my question is that, is it, is it really harmonious as it is? Are there no tension at all? Are there actually people accept this strategy or are there any other voices? Okay, this image is just a uh, few example. For example, it's too small, but in the middle there is a uh, announcement, jangan berisik in three languages, in Indonesian, in English, and in Mandarin. Because that actually intentionally put by the people of the neighborhood of Jeti clan, the old community that used to live in a very quiet and peace suddenly become <laughs> hectic with the tourists. And the way tourists do, just like what happened in uh, Reykjavik in Iceland, <laughs> people come to their house, take a picture, <laughs> and then they just go out of that. Because there is no concept of, what we call it, pagar, uh, fences, fans and everything. It's part of their clan community style of life in 500 years. Suddenly the tourists come, the, the way tourists come, it's not just like the 12 student of residency, <laughs> right? I know the way you, you motivate them to introduce themselves, to interact with the people, it's being locals or uh, embed with the locals. This one, of course not. The tourists, weekenders, getting there, jump into their <laughs> front yard, taking a picture, oh nice, flowers. <laughs> Imagine your house, you're staying in the living room and then suddenly you see, looking at the window, so many people taking a pictures of your foot, uh, your motorcycle, your anything. So it would be nice. So that's kind of reaction. There is no street protest in this town. There is no, oh, we don't want the tourists. No, nope. but the protest, it's silent. How come I cap capture that? Because during the interview, no one want to say anything. And that's part of the seeker in Malaysia. Everything is harmonious. We are coming from three racial group, Malay. Malay is identical with Muslim. And then, so if you are Malay but not Muslim, it would be quite chaotic in the mind. And then if you are uh, Chinese, you have to be the Chinese Malaysian. It's different with the Chinese Singaporean. We have to separate with them. <laughs> and, uh, and then if you are an Indian, then it's an Indian which is actually weird because Indian is also coming from many angles. That would be Tamil, that would be Mangalayam, that would be Bangla, so many elements. They want to make it simple in the national imagination, or I call it national heritage imagination. However, on the street level, on the neighborhood level, all tension is actually there. When I officially interview, using interview, using survey board, no one say anything. My data won't say anything. But my collection of photograph might say something. So that's the main point here with photo documentation. Just give, um, I won't go deeper that. If you are interested to see this, the narrative of this, it's already published as a book, Creative Voice of the City. It's available for free. Uh, thankfully, before I came here, the embargo from the National Archive of Sweden, it's also already open. I'm happy to share the link afterward, but just Googling it, Creative Voice of the City, Zaki, or I'll, I'll, I'll give you a link afterward. Uh, and the whole narrative. The case study, it's not only from Georgetown, but also from Bandung, Indonesia. <laughs> okay, it's supposed to be there's an audio element here, but no worries, it cannot be played. Uh, but the idea of photo documentation also come, how can, okay, okay, Mazaki, that's the way we do, that's the question. But how come I present it? Now in the new media environment, how can I present all these 4,000 images? <laughs> Should I make an exhibition? Could be. Should I make a book? Why not? Should I invite the people that I took a picture? Should. That's a good idea. 
But when it comes to presenting the data and the whole narrative, it's actually many possibilities. I choose the possibility to combine with the soundscape. So while people you looking at the book, there is a soundscape of everyday life. So every time I took the pictures, usually I after I got the consent from the group of the people, I record the sound of the environment. This one coming from a specific group on the craft community who've been doing the craft, but of course neglected by the official city campaign, similar like in Belfast story <laughs> yesterday. Uh, and, and many of actually similar group is actually being neglected in the official program of becoming UNESCO Creative City, the UNESCO Heritage City. So between the photos and the sounds element, I combine it. But maybe you can ask, why bother? Why don't why to make it this kind of element? Why don't you make a video documentary? That's a different narrative. <laughs> I think Gaya will <laughs> speak that further. With the video, you don't attract people because my intention. People pay attention with this still image while understanding the environment that actually not coming from the photograph. I intentionally mix the, that, the location precisely. So if it is coming from one particular group of creative, maybe the sound is coming from the street, not really in front of them, but the sound from them is actually juxtaposed. I think it's related with Panitza uh, yesterday on this very idea. I, well, actually, I learned from you. <laughs> Thanks to Panitza on the very idea of juxtaposition. Apart from visual juxtaposition, we can also visual and audio juxtaposition in this particular case. Or at any other point is also on the element of other thing. Uh, one solars in Singapore is juxtaposed between visual and smell <laughs> because he focused on what he call olfactory politics. Some of you been to Singapore. You know that this city, of course, by joking, is a very fine city. You know that jokes, right? Kota yang fine. Because in English, fine have two meanings. Fine, bagus, indah, atau denda. <laughs> Everything is fine. If you do things, you speed on the road, you even put the sticker on something, even though it's a smiley sticker, it happened to an activist at the time. Uh, also, the control of smoking, not just the smoke, according to this researcher, the, the, sh the smell of afterward. That's why it's really controlled. So he dig deeper that by combining on the element of visual, taking the pictures of the dedicated corner of the smoking room, smoking that, smoking that, and then he collected the element of that. On the technical aspect, I don't understand myself how you can present smell. But that's how he, he, he did it. That. Of course, it's mostly the report is academically at the time, not from the angle. Next. Uh, it's another alum, uh, just another example between the visual and the alternative narrative. And then in the book, you can also see this one is I combine between the photographs and the storytelling on the uh, narrative of written narrative. So I think it's similar with some of the students pre who presented that. I forgot the name, whether it's Lola or other, I think. When he or she presented, starting from her position, looking at the subject. So this is what I did as well. I was waiting for my foot, but apparently I just realized after years, the place that I always come every single year is actually the theater of the city. That's called Lebuh Chulia. Lebuh in Mal Malay, meaning uh, bigger alley, uh, gang yang lebih besar, but not main road. So in Lebuh Chulia, every single night is the performative of the creativity. There is no such a photography, creative hub, creative corner, creative this is all creativity, but on the plate, on the food, on the street, on the cart, and then I witness that, and then I build a storytelling and, and using a written and photography as well. Next. Uh, similar, and then I continue in 2022 with Yogyakarta. It's specifically, of course, responding to the pandemic. Next, just a few examples you can read online, the paper, uh, and any other publication on that. Next. Yeah, since we cannot play the audio, uh, but it's similar. So when it comes to the presentation of that, next, uh, there is an audio of the here, in this particular case, I want to talk about the tedious work 
a repetitive work of creativity as as never being imagined and never being documented in any creative economy document. Now in Indonesia and anywhere else, creative economy, economy creative, economy creative is become a buzzword. No one really talk how tedious the work, how repetitive the work, and they've been doing that as well. So I documented as well the the sound of this repetitiveness coming from many angles and then when I combine with the visual then the sound might affect the way people see the, the, the issue. Next. Uh, this is a promise, no, it's, a, uh, <laughs> it's not finished yet or not even officially yet because we, we just have our PI, Principal Investigator, Mas Mozain, return back from London. Uh, we, we as a team, my, my friend and I just got a grant from British Museum. We are going to work for the next two years in Aceh, the Documenting Endangered Material Knowledge Program. So we are actually officially in the contract of the grant are not allowed to make documentary film or documentary photography. Are not allowed. We have to make documentation visually <laughs> and also auditory as well. Because British Museum wanted us to uh, contribute on the collection of museum that it's supposed to be, of course, using the way the British Museum understand, supposed to be objectively <laughs> speaking. But of course, we realize it won't be. Sub it's still not subjective. But at least we don't put the narrative in the editing room. It has to be as it is. And since the focus is actually on the material aspect, this one is an example from next. Uh, it's there is a video. Can we hear the sound? Yeah, uh, there is only one guy that left in the whole Aceh who still make Chanang Charke, the traditional music. So we are going to focus not profiling the person as in documentary, but focusing on the materiality, the tools, the making, the process, and everything. Uh, it's not starting yet, so we just have our PI written back from London for the training. As usual, British Museum like to train you first before you can embark to the process. So it's still a mystery, so bear with me and keep in touch, or maybe you want to know the update at some point. It's going to be a two years project anyway. So that's, I will end the photo documentation with that. Then next, still I have three, four minutes? No, I, yeah, three, four minutes. Uh, Mas Angga is a nice moderator. This one is truly fine moderator, not like the, the previous joke. Thank you, Mas Angga. Because the last uh, two aspects, it's mainly about more elaboration. Photo elicitation is not simply a critic of photo documentation, but actually a different angle. Photo voice is another completely different angle. In photo elicitation, it's not about how many as detailed as possible you collect the data. Nope. It's about how you can capture something that actually could trigger your subject whether it's a research subject or whether it's your uh, collaborator in your artistic project, to elicit something. Elicit mean menggali, menggali kembali. Uh, karena kadang in dalam situasi sosial, terutama ketika kita bekerja dengan kelompok-kelompok vulnerable. When we work with vulnerable communities, we cannot just simply, even though you already have the consent, okay, udah enjoy, nyaman, one week, getting along, Makan bakso bareng, ya kan? Eh, bakwan, ya kalau di sini kita ngomongnya. Bakwan, bakwan, dah bakwan kawin malang, hang out. Then you took a pictures. Nothing happened. You come back to your office, you come back to your studio, and then you just realize all my photograph don't say anything at all. Nothing is being said. I cannot make any narrative at all. Everything looks fine. So there is no issue. She's happy. Of course, she, for example, I give you an example. She's maybe a... Uh, uh, a victim of domestic abuse, but she's fine. She's look happy when I add together. I took the pictures of her, and then suddenly, well, <laughs> there is no imagery of that. There is no wound, there's nothing. But you know the data. But how come? How should I dig deeper? In a humanly way, not by pushing. Ayo, pernah di siksa ya? Pernah disiksa? Jawab, jawab. You cannot do that, right? As a researcher or photographer. So, elite citation is actually. It's either you take the picture or you ask them nicely to take the pictures themselves using any simple devices or the thing that they are familiar with. 
ask them to take a picture. Usually the trigger is, udah tiga hari ke depan foto aja apa yang menurutmu menarik. Apa foto saya nggak bisa motret? Apa aja. Just take any pictures you are think interested. Then you sit together on the fourth day, you talk, elicit it. Hah? Kenapa motret handbag? Why you took the picture of your handbag? Oh no, it's because the handbag is uh, bought by my mom. Where's your mom now? My mom is now living in uh, uh, Dubai. She worked there as a migrant worker. Oh, so she rarely w- coming home. Yeah, she want to coming home, but she realized that coming home is quite struggling. She will lose the money anyway. It will be captured by the whole extended family. We cannot get the money. While at the same time, she cannot go back there because my, my dad will not allow that. So she will stay. But you never talk to your mom? Of course I talk. Zoom and link, but I miss her. Then you talk deeper. I miss her. And then you get the cue. When you get the cue, you explore further from one single image of handbag in a very bad picture. <laughs> Maybe. So that's photo elicitation. At the end, in your report, you don't show the pictures. You show the narrative. Maybe you show some pictures just to give as an illustration, but it's not that matter. It's how you elicit it. So far, the technique to elicit it is interview, but of course there are many other techniques. Maybe go along, you walk, you see, ah, yuk makan sore, kemana biasanya kalau jajan? Then you know that every single places that they come, it's always have a meaningful to this person. Then it's not about the interview, it's about places that you are visited together. Why you always go to this bengkel, why you always go to that distro, So that photo elicitation might mean something. Uh, I don't want to go deeper with photo voice. I don't think it's also not the context of this and also require a bigger project. Photo voice, it's not just to elicit the question. You work together with your subject and it's not just digging information, it's changing the situation. <laughs> so it's a little bit more uh, participatory and in-depth. Uh, some of the example, it's happened in Amazonia. Other example also uh, big things happen in some other areas when the main idea is not the photograph, it's not the data that you collect, it's changing the situation in a better way. It's 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 more longitudinal we call it. Lahir, udah ini cuma contoh contoh. Next, this is just an example. Oh, okay, I want to stop here. That's me, couple years back, uh, <laughs> and also long uh, years back when I still have my hair here. <laughs> Sometimes I also gave the camera to my son. Even ta- on the technical aspect, since 2015, if I'm not mistaken, I changed the whole of my device into the point and shoot camera, the simplest one. So it won't give a uh, pressure to my subject. Uh, sometimes the subject, uh, my su- research subject, is also don't want to take the picture with y- their own phone. Maybe it's about etiquette. Maybe in other groups, it's also about. Uh, Uh, confidence. So sometimes I just put the camera there. Eh, mas, boleh pinjam? Oh, boleh, boleh, boleh. Taking picture. Bro. Then I use this photograph to. So I help them in making things. It's part of my uh, field work. And then they took the pictures. And then afterward, apparently s- they took more than just me inside the frame. They took also their friend. And then I just realized in the third pictures underneath, during the work, they also picking up their kids feeding them, putting, w- working with them, and then returning back. Then I dig deeper. Why your kid is always in the studio, still using uniform? Where are the papa? Then the whole story. I don't want to go there because it's part of the detailed data. Then the whole story of familial issue, relationship, and also apparently what is actually work for them. And then in my chapter, I call it labor of love. The labor of love. It's not just patient in doing thing. Nope. It's not about cross-setting, knitting. It's the love. Not just romantic love, but also the love of doing thing while also raising the kids, dealing with f- uh, relationship issue, and so on and so on. Terakhir. Udah, lanjut. Uh, the similar. Uh, lanjut lagi. <laughs> Ini another example. Keep going. Uh, just slideshow. Langsung aja pelan-pelan, until I say stop, ya, yeah. ya, yeah, stop aja dulu. The, 
the previous uh, slideshow is about another technique. You can combine this photo documentation, photo elicitation with another technique, or this approach might be standing by themselves. It's called re-photography, which is not new. I'm not the inventor <laughs> of this. It's been years, right? Uh, if you can, wa you want to take a look on the history of this approach, you can take a look. Gary McLeod is a British uh, photographer who also teaches in uh, in Japanese university, and John Rieger. Just googling next. Uh, what I want to say: re-photography. Usually, it's being used for talking about time, because you take old pictures mixed with the current pictures, or the other way around. Next. Uh, in this case, sometimes you can try the audience to engage with new understanding of why about this issue or why about the place or why about this aspect. When it comes to the technique, many technique, of course, you can use these two examples. They use the technique of taking picture and then mixing in the editing room. In my case, the previous example, I was, of course, everyone experienced that during the pandemic. Uh, you were in Indonesia, you were in Italy, in France, in, in and then I was in a small town that consists of 40,000 <laughs> population. And during the summertime, poof, half of them is gone. <laughs> Not because of the pandemic, because holiday, <laughs> summer holiday. Everyone worked in the university or research center, and then suddenly they're gone. So with these only 20,000 people not going to the office, during the pandemic, there is no restriction in Sweden, so everyone can still move around. While moving around and staying at home, it's basically the same. No one at there. <laughs> so, and then I myself, as an Indonesian, missing and worry about my family as well back here. So what should I do? What should I think? What is actually the place mean to me? What is actually loneliness that actually gap? So I used that technique previously for next month. Uh, doing that and then this kind of re-photography, exploring and learning from other, rather than I took all pictures and put inside, I took empty pictures. I used the Polaroid, create, uh, you know when you make a Polaroid and then fail? It's just showing a black things or anything, or maybe like there is a vague image, but not clear enough, so I use that to re-photograph and imagine that this is all, next month, all my daily life, is actually somehow there is a void inside. So this one, a little bit already mixed between the social and the artistic approach. And since I'm not starting talking about the social issue there, here and there per se, I started with my personal emotion next. And then eventually this personal emotion, walking on the every day, this is my everyday doing, my everyday place that I took, my road to the, to the office, but there is always a void. And then I went to the library, check on the issue, what happened during the uh, Spanish flu pandemic in 1930s, yeah, what ha roughly, and then what happened during other pandemic, what happened during pandemic in Indonesia, the term void, it's always there. People feel that void, next. And this kind of void, oh no, this other thing, uh, before that, yeah, the penutup. Uh, so re-photography, I just want to say that re-photography, if you're Googling it or do a literature review, might be about time, might be about history, that's the most common thing. But it could be, it could be. Because I saw some potential from the previous presentation from the residence student participant. It could be about the way they want to talk about the subject, the issue, the void, the emotion of the people felt during a particular moment and during that. Closing, ini sedikit iklan ini, a little bit of promotional, something that is still ongoing, but also capturing all that kind of technique. Oh, previously, mas, sebelumnya, mas, sebelumnya. Uh, currently, I'm just uh, preparing of a photo book. So, while everything is digital, blah, 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 but lately, like Gaya said yesterday about transmediality and trans, uh, I also explore that of uh, multi-modality. I return back to the very medium that definitely not digital, it's called book, buku, and in the genre of book and in the genre of art book, we have photo book. So 
I currently preparing Subtle Encounter. It's about in the memory of places coming from my 10 years of work, uh, my second stage of doing photography. I just realized that everything about memory. I think it's also affect me during the pandemic to reflect upon my photographic practice myself. But here, the multimodality, it's still uh, non-digital actually, but combining between the modality of visual storytelling and the poem, Mas Angga, the poem. Next, yang the other book, Abandon and Beyond, starting from more social issue, very hardcore social issue about how the impact of physical infrastructure development in a particular city, in this case Yogyakarta, affect on the more creation of abandoned space rather than <laughs> a good looking space, a functional space, a social space. So I collected that and then it's become this book. Next, uh, you can, this is uh, spill out ticket sis. This is just the content of the book. Uh, and then in this case, the multi-sensory modalities, the book it's rough, the book it's dirty, the book it's smelly. Yes. So you cannot feel that, unfortunately. You have to feel that. So the book it consists of burned material, like plastic, the one that I found in abandoned space. Of course, the visual, the, oh, I, I covered it. Yeah, you can take a look there. And then there is uh, anything that symbolically coming from the any abandoned space. Of course, I'm not literally taking the material from the, the place. <laughs> I recreate that in, my st in the studio. And then combine with the auditory element as well. So I collected the soundscape. And then uh, since we cannot hear the sound, so you can scan the QR code and then you see the album in SoundCloud. And I will add that more in the in I think in the meantime, because I'm interested in that aspect as well. So you have to touch it. There is a sticky one. You have to peel it up because we need the tactile experience to, to feel that. So in this case, the book become the only the media to feel the issue, to feel to be there in abandoned spaces. Uh, yeah, this one is, I think, the part that is quite smelly. When I meant smelly, it's not smell of waste, but smell of burned material, paper and everything. Okay, I think you got the point. Next, Mas. Uh, dah, penutup, lanjut. Yeah, since I don't bring it with me, because it's already being bought by the curator, so it will be ex showcase all these two books, along with other books in the Indonesian Photo Book Tour. Also, some other books are also quite experimental. It will tour in Singapore next week. No, this week, 19th of September. It will be brought to Berlin and London. Maybe some of you will be in the city at the time, just Googling it. It's organized by Gue Ari Gallery, Jakarta. Thank you very much to maybe the way I talk today. It's quite many layer of information. Lanjut, Mas. Uh, if you want to take a look deeper in nice way or maybe in a very chronological order, feel free to explore further from more further reading as well as my previous work, just scan this QR code and you can get a look. Some of them is actually for op, uh, open access. Some of them require subscription. <laughs> so if you have any issue with subscription, just let me know, email me or DM me in Instagram. Okay, some of you don't want to DM me because uh, yeah, maybe you are worried I'm not fall back. Yeah, uh, it's okay. <laughs> just DM me or email me uh, at Zakiadubi, and then I'm happy to share this. The those document that is still require subscription if it is useful for you. Sorry, Mas Angga, <laughs> to take this because I'm too enthusiastic in the last part. I hope it won't ruin the plan, Gaya, and still we still have time. Uh, that will be all from me. Thank you very much. Applause for Mr. Zaki. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's very interesting. Uh, at the main point that uh, I really like about um, what. Mr. Saki said earlier is about that photography itself is not just the simple practice that we have in everyday life, yeah, but we have a deeper meaning than it can be, uh, you know, implemented into research and into various um, work. Yeah, that maybe if any of the uh, audience have any question about how to. Uh, dig deeper into photographic method as in research. Maybe you can ask 
uh, Mr. Zaki uh, in Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. Or as well as the other way around, if you do photography as a as an art practices, definitely you need research prior that, right? That's why I, I usually define uh, before the curator of the gallery where my book is will be brought or to the uh, academic grant, I always use this term to describe myself. I always like uh, employ photography within my academic research. At the same time, I also uh, um, uh, do the rigorous research prior embarking to my photographic practices. Of course, it might be a different pathway, or it's slightly you need to modify it. But I think whether your starting point is an ac- ac- uh, student or ac- in, in an academic context as well as in artistic practice, the research element is still quite beneficial, I would say. Thank you. But we keep that for the discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't want to uh, yeah. take that. No, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Zaki. Now we have the second uh, speaker, Miss uh, Gaya Squarchi. Uh, maybe you can join us in the front. <coughs> Hello. It is hard to come after such a where? Oh. Already. It was zoomed. Hello, hello. Oh great. Thank you. <laughs> I was saying it's it's hard to come uh, after such a great speaker. Uh, as Zaki, um, but I'll try. <laughs> I still s- hear my voice, it's really annoying, but okay, I'll try. Um, I'm an Italian uh, photographer, uh, and I work in video as well, and when I teach, I try to um, help students develop uh, projects um, that involve other mediums as well, um, alongside photography. And I think something that we really learned from this talk is that photography needs to be seen as a tool, not as a religion, not as something saint. Good photographers are not masters of life. We just need to think of what we want to say and find the best way to say it. Sometimes it's photography, sometimes it can be other mediums. So I'll just... uh, show a couple projects. They're not the most recent, but I think it, they can be um, they can be useful to um, to hear about in this uh, in this context. And then since you know working in photography and video is nothing new, it's been around for a while, I thought that um, I wanted to um, reflect on a few examples that can um, that would enable us to talk about the way uh, photography changes and shapes uh, our relationship with reality today. So I'll start from this short audio piece um, that I worked on because uh, during the pandemic I was in New York City 
and I kept reading about cases of domestic violence being on the rise. As a photographer, of course, uh, uh, I didn't know how to work on this without endangering anyone. There were a lot of obstacles, but I still wanted to do it. I didn't know which form this could have taken. So I um, contacted a number of organizations that were helping women um, who suffered situations of domestic violence, and uh, most of them didn't reply. Uh, one did, and she put me in contact with a woman. I asked her uh, if I could record our call, the first time we had a call, and uh, I edited a short uh, audio piece out of our conversation. I hope the audio works. I'll try. I think I need to. Burbuja para que ella no viera el monstruo que es su papá. Como la ignora, como la. Le dice palabras fea, bruja, y ella lo percibe. Ella me dice muchas veces que no quiere un papi porque los papis son malos. Yo le explico que mi papá es bueno, lo, el abuelo es bueno, el abuelo te quiere. No, los pa él es un abuelo, pero los papás son malos. Y solo tiene cuatro años. Y el motivo por el cual nos vinieron los problemas porque él no quería la existencia de la niña. Quería que la abortara. Tuve que irme a mi país para tener la niña. Y bueno, ahora ya cuando salga de todo esto, empiezo el proceso de divorcio, de esas cosas. Pero también esto me ha impactado mucho en el sentido de... A veces hablamos de, de violencia doméstica y solo pensamos en un golpe físico. No pensamos en lo emocional. Yo no pienso casarme jamás. No quiero una pareja a mi lado ni a alguien destruya mi vida ni mi felicidad porque durante mucho, durante 15 años estuve aceptándolo todo creo que esa parte de mi vida queda mutilada, lo único que quiero es un hogar estable para criar mis hijas eso lo voy a lograr por mí misma esto me ha hecho ver que fuerte soy So here we're talking about psychological violence not uh, physical violence and I feel like that's a, a topic uh, that it's not talked about enough, it's not understood enough, it's not seen as a form of violence. And it's al obviously very hard to, uh, to investigate, uh, much harder than the physical one. Um, for a year, uh, this woman and I stayed in contact on, uh, on the phone, we never met. And so I think it made sense, even if this audio piece is very, very simple, as simple as it comes, um, that we cannot see this face uh, of this woman, that we don't know her name yet, because this is the, the situation we were in. And the fact that everything was happening behind closed doors and we didn't have access to this situation was the hardest part of what we knew was go what was going on. Then after a year, um, and, and also the fact that you hear the, phone, the, the voice on the phone uh, gives a sensation of remoteness that I think makes sense in this case. Um, then after a year when her marriage ended and she was able to find another job and move away uh, to live in another flat, I was able to meet her. And uh, I used a, a, short, a small National Geographic grant to uh, create a, a web page uh, that, would, um, that, that could include photography, uh, text, uh, and audio, and also a small part of infographic. Because I knew, as Zaki was saying, this is not about the images. There, is, there was only so much I could say with the images. Uh, I don't know how to code. Um, and I didn't have an, an enormous budget to pay someone for this. So uh, I used a um, software called ReadyMag. There is another one called Slices uh, that you can use if you want to do uh, the same. And uh, I wanted to use uh, her words. So I just wrote a small introduction. Uh, and uh, from here on, the rest of the, the text uh, is coming directly from, from her, her words. She was uh, incredibly um, lucid and articulate in explaining the situation um, that she was in. 
and I created uh, short video pieces, each one related to you know a short scene uh, or a, a specific topic, um, and the rest, uh, you know, the spine of uh, of the work develops through audio uh, and, and through text. It enabled me to talk about uh, psychological violence, which uh, starts from control, isolation from friends and family, it goes on with economical violence, and it completely destroys your self-esteem. So when we wonder why women don't get out of this situation, it's because it's really hard to do it when you're convinced that you're worth nothing and you could do nothing in the world alone at that point. Um, Something that really uh, added up to the story was when Ninoska's um, mother came from Santo Domingo to help her with the kid. And uh, then there were three women uh, who suffered domestic violence reunited under their same roof who were reconstructing their lives. I go on a little faster. Here is her mother. They, both, uh, they all came from Santo Domingo and her mother also um, suffered um, physical violence uh, at the hand of uh, Ninoska's father, and she was from forbidden from using any kind of contraception. So by the time she was 19, she had three kids, and the only way in that society at that time that her own mother had to protect her was to have her sterilized. So again, when we talk about violence, it's not just punches. Um, I really enjoyed working on this story of, of reconstruction with, uh, with uh, these two women and also with, uh, with the little one who was recovering very well from the, uh, from the experience. Um, and, I, and I think uh, she also, because I, I hoped that this would be able to give her something back, I also think she gained confidence from working on this story, and now she's informing me about uh, events related to uh, domestic violence awareness. And she was there, she had already been prepared to work on this um, by a psychologist that she had started working on. So I could see the things that she was telling me sometimes are the things that you talk about uh, with a psychologist. Um, and that kind of assistance uh, is incredibly important. Aside from the web page, I wanted to bring um, this to a space. Uh, and I worked with um, a collective called Disturb. It's a French collective. Uh, they do pastings of um, photos of uh, poster format of documentary themes with detailed captions uh, in the streets. Sometimes, I, for instance, we um, we decided where to do it. We uh, chose two neighborhoods in um, in uh, New York that have uh, a high number of uh, calls to the police because of uh, reasons related to domestic violence. In, the ca in this case, the Bronx and Washington Heights, which is where Ninoska lived. And uh, we wrote the caption in Spanish because uh, mm, a big percentage of uh, the population of those neighborhoods is a native Spanish speaker. And we added two numbers uh, of domestic violence uh, hotlines that people could call if they felt they were endangered or someone they knew. And then I wanted to contextualize in a very badly designed infographic <laughs> because I, I don't know, you know, there, there was no designer on this, uh, on, this, uh, on this project. I wanted to contextualize her story in what was happening more broadly. So we, we worked, uh, mm, Nian and, um, and uh, someone who has a, a data background, we worked with the mayor's office in, in New York City to find this, uh, um, this source, Safe Horizon. They gave us uh, the, um, the data uh, for uh, the calls to the main domestic violence hotline from 2014 to 2019. And we can see that the number decreases, so the situation seems to improve. And then there's a spike in 2020. Um, we zoomed in, let's say, on 2020 and 2021, and we saw that, interestingly, the calls went down right when the lockdown started because we were all in survival mode. We didn't know what was happening, 
and then they they went up considerably in the months and in the weeks following the first uh, the, the notice of the lockdown, and they stayed quite high until February 2022. And then I added um, um, an interview with a woman who put me in contact with Ninoska in the first place, uh, who is uh, uh, who was dealing with a lot of cases uh, in uh, in a similar way. Um, and, and everything was worsened by the fact that she couldn't contact uh, the women as, as she would do once uh, because, of, because of the lockdown, because they were locked at home with their abusers. Uh, I can talk more about this if you want later, but uh, another project that I would like to um, present is uh, the first project I've ever worked on, um, which um, which I started working on uh, in 2012 when I went to um, when I went to New York to study photography, and I started realizing that my identity was starting to be shaped based on the way I saw things. So I asked myself, who would I be if I couldn't see? And I asked uh, a number of um, visually impaired and blind people to guide me into their lives. What I was interested in was not the disability itself, uh, but uh, how a blind person navigates um, a world that is based on the rules of seeing. Everything we do um, and the way we work today. And I think there is a big disconnect between the fascination we have in literature and in music and in myth mythology with the idea of blindness and the reality of it. The reality of it is that we don't engage with people who are blind because we are afraid to engage with someone who lives daily an experience that terrifies us. So they're cut off. Um, I photographed in a number of situations. This, for instance, was a restaurant um, in New York where the, only the kitchen was lit and the dining room is in the dark. So you could have the experience of dining without seeing anything. And the only ones who could guide you, who could have you sit down, who could uh, do things for you were blind people because they, they were the only ones who could find orientation in the dark. And I wondered, how is it to dance for the first time with someone that you've never met at a party? All these people, you know, we, we divide um, society and people who see and people who cannot see. But all these people that I worked on um, have lost sight after living years of a sighted life. So it could be ha me tomorrow with the same sense of humor, personality, idiosyncrasies. And I try to break a little bit of that barrier. Um, on the left here, we have a visually impaired man. Uh, on the center, a blind man and, and a, a sighted woman on, on the right. So I knew that these three people would have a completely different experience of the film that they were going to watch. And there was a, a woman who had a baby premature, and, and she was saying that when um, uh, nurses had, you know, in very fast uh, and intense situation, talk to her, they would actually talk to her husband as, as if she couldn't understand what they were saying, but they were afraid to engage with her. So the first time that I that I um, started photographing, it's because I, I contacted a center organizing activities for the blind and visually impaired in New York. And this was um, a class of photography for blind people. Um, they all had lost sight during life, so they mm, visual clues made sense to them. There was a, 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 guy, um, a sighted photographer who was guiding them, helping them, but they would decide, okay, I want to take a photo of you, Zaki, with a, a red hat on your head and sitting on a white, uh, white armchair. And they would take photos on a pitch, uh, in a pitch black environment with a camera on a tripod. And uh, they would take, th they would create uh, light with torches, so the accumulation of light in time would shape the picture. The pictures were very eerie and strange and beautiful, but they couldn't see them. They couldn't see the pictures that they had just taken. Um, so 
Mark, uh, the teacher, would print them out and describe the pictures to them. And I thought that describing is something that we, it's an ability that we have lost completely because the moment we have want to explain anything, we just show a picture, show an image. And so I wanted to work on this capability to imagine that description was, you know, un unleashing, you know, it was triggering. I worked with the curator Laurence Cornet, who is now actually an editor at uh, Le Monde, and we conceived together an installation where people could uh, first uh, uh, experience the image through other senses. Um, so we, uh, we had an illustrator um, translate into drawings the photos, and then the drawings were, tra were transformed into base relief uh, prints by a firm called Zykem, which produces material for the education of the blind and visually impaired. You can see a couple of uh, examples here. And then this was uh, 10 years ago almost at Musée de l'Elysée uh, in uh, Switzerland, in Lausanne. And uh, the visitor would uh, come in front of each uh, artwork uh, and they could experience first the base relief print. And then I, I created an audio because I had asked a number of people uh, with different backgrounds to describe the pictures the first time they saw them without giving them any clues of what they were actually about. Um, describe them in, in different ways as, as if they were guided the, in, into the scene, as if it was a memory. I was not interested and then I edited uh, different voices together. So the visitor could experience the image through the sensibility of someone else. What I was interested in was really not the accuracy of the descriptions, but the possibility for this to become um, an exploration of an image. You can see here how it worked. And there was a, um, an installation also at Photoville, a festival in New York, where I was able to invite the collective of blind uh, photographers that I had worked on. Uh, this is a very old video. But what I liked about that situation is that uh, there were a number of people who were sighted regular visitors who stepped in and started trying to describe the pictures to the blind. And I think that was an, you know, an in, an probably more enriching for them than for the blind who always um, are in, uh, you know, need to find news way, new ways to experience uh, the work. Um, but also, it doesn't happen that often. Like, how many times do you see blind and, and visually uh, and, uh, and sighted people who are not social workers interact in daily life? So, talking about video and photography as, uh, or audio as uh, something new, I think would be missing the point. The, situa the, the conversation came up uh, when uh, photo cameras started to being able to shoot also video. So technically photographers were encouraged to try. But um, actually, for instance, in, uh, in uh, the 62, Chris Marker created this, uh, this short film, La Jete, which is made almost entirely of stills um, and which played with the notion of time. Um, because uh, mm, what d what distinguishes uh, video and audio from photography is that the, these two mediums are time-based and photography is not. But also film creates the illusion of movement um, with the, the fast succession of 24 frames in a second. And so the whole story uh, worked on it, and, I, and here I screenshotted every still of um, of uh, two different scenes, and I sometimes use them to uh, to explain photographers uh, how you need to work in a scene in video, like covering from different points of view, as opposed to what they would do in photography, or. Uh, for instance, uh, artists uh, like uh, Sophie Kahl or Wolfgang Tillmans moved very freely through mediums. They used video art, they used documentary, uh, they, they wrote, um, they used installations in different way according to what they wanted to say. The point was never the medium for the sake of it or the new for the sake of being new. 
which brings us to today, <laughs> you know. Uh, talking, I, I think it would uh, be impossible to talk about the use we, we make of uh, media today without talking about social media. And this quote came to mind by media theorist uh, Neil Postman, Orwell fel feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared that the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. And while Orwell was definitely winning during the pandemic, I think <laughs> Huxley now has the, the, the better end. I don't know if you've ever seen this, uh, this uh, Instagram account. It's called InstaRepeat. It's, it puts together images uh, with similar hashtags or same hashtags. And it questions our originality in the way <laughs> we see the world. And we decide to tell about our experiences. Um, I think it also makes us think, also not, not only regular users, but also as photographers. I think we change the, the way we photograph so that our photographs can be successful on Instagram. We started uh, using much more central subject, immediately readable, you know, something that good, would, would look good at this size. Imagine seeing this photograph by Jeff Wall on a phone. Um, this is called The Sudden Gust of Wind. It's based by an artwork by Okuzai. I think you can all imagine how much better it would be to see a big print of this uh, instead of seeing it small because you're in on, on an Instagram feed is going to disappear. You're not going to see what happens in the bottom left corner exactly. And it also makes us think, even in photography, how each subgenre of photography um, you know, it's, it's really hard to be original. We all influence uh, each other from different points of view. Of composition, of using of light, there, there's a very aesthetic uh, focus today instead of focusing on the substance. So everyone walks around with a camera today uh, in our pocket. And sometimes uh, regular people have better access um, than photojournalists to what happens every day, daily events that can be also very, uh, very important. I don't know how much you know about what's happening in the United States, but um, it's kind of uh, regular for the police to kill unarmed black men and not being prosecuted because of it. This case was different. This horrific video, I'm sure many of you remember from, uh, I think it was May last year, shot by a 17-year-old passerby, uh, enabled uh, you know, the investigation to take uh, place in a completely different way because it sparked outrage, because she uploaded, um, uh, Dranella Fraser uh, uploaded the, the video on uh, social media, uh, and in a few hours, it sparked outrage, it sparked protests. Black Lives Matter became uh, an, an, Im an important movement, very central in the fact that uh, Derek Chauvin, this, uh, this policeman in Minneapolis, has been convicted to 21 years in prison. I think we can all argue that it probably wouldn't happen if there hadn't been this, uh, uh, this documentation, but also uh, the wave that came from this. Surveillance can be useful also in, in other situations. Um, this particular piece uh, by the New York Times, which is, 20, uh, which is a 28 uh, minute long uh, um, video piece, um, is based on, uh, on an investigation on, uh, on the massacre of civilians that happened during the war in Ukraine in Busha last year in March. The corpses of 36 uh, civilians have been found on uh, uh, Yublanska street, street. And uh, uh, reporters from the New York Times were able to use uh, uh, CCTV cameras, um, photos and video shot by residents of, uh, of that neighborhood, and uh, wiretapping from radio communication between soldiers, but also from uh, the phones that uh, Russian soldiers had stolen from the people they had just killed. And they called to Russia. And so the tracking of these uh, calls enabled um, the reporters to, um, to get to one specific uh, unit of paratroopers in, in the Russian army. 
Of course, uh, these killings haven't been prosecuted because the government is still in place. Um, but we hope they can be good material one day to bring these people to justice. But it also makes me think this was a useful investigation, something useful to, to watch. But material like this, which is quite shocking, and sometimes it happened, it's related to accidents that we cannot do much about, and they're just violent, happen to, uh, to appear every day in our feeds, when we're having breakfast, when we're talking to our mothers, and I think it does have an impact on our mental health. And sometimes I wish I wasn't exposed to that. Now, let's look at the opposite example. A photo that wants to prove a lot, but it actually can be used uh, in, in many different ways. Republicans um, have, uh, well, let's start from, from the Democrats. Dem Democrats are cheering because uh, um, former US President Donald Trump was arrested briefly and released on bail because sever of several charges. And for them, uh, this recent mugshot um, proves that, uh, that Trump is a criminal. For Republicans, um, it proves that he's a hero, he's a martyr, he's, uh, you know, that the system is against him. They uh, went so far um, that they, um, they compared him to uh, Mandela or Martin Luther King, people who really fought uh, and uh, risked their lives and sometimes died for their rights and the, and the rights of, uh, of their people. Um, the former president who really understands the power of the media uh, within hours from being released, uploaded the picture for, uh, on his uh, on his ex, uh, ex former Twitter account, and he started using for uh, fundraising and his merchandise. And now this is not uh, an advertising that is related to his own campaign. This is just a, a commercial opportunity. But I think this custom text thing. Is, is really what hooked me, because what's basically saying is, here you can write your own reality, and I'm gonna sell it to you. <laughs> and this is what happens every day, whether we realize it or not. But thankfully, there's science when they, we're tired of, uh, of politics. And uh, I think you can remember from last year the, the photos uh, from the James Webb Telescope that enable us to see in deep space like never before. Um, but the thing is, the, the images that were, were created thanks to infrared light. And infrared light is not the way we see. So basically what, what we got was the picture on the left. And if the news of this groundbreaking te technology had come out with uh, the picture on the left, I think we wouldn't have been that impressed. Uh, and also, NASA needed to justify the investment of $10 billion <laughs> in, this, uh, in this telescope. So what they did uh, was making the image more readable. And by the way, this is not, they didn't try to hide this, this process, but what most people see and don't question is the picture on the right. They added colors. And colors are related to the presence of specific elements like uh, sulfur or oxygen. So to the ones who know how to read the picture, um, they act a little bit like maps. But for most of us, villains, you know, they just needed to be effective and relatable. And how did they make it relatable? How uh, were these, uh, these colors chosen? Elizabeth Kessler, who is a, uh, an art historian at Stanford, um, argued um, that the colors were chosen that, the, that were chosen relate to a color palette used in um, in uh, paintings of the 19th century, related to um, to the conquest of the West, the American conquest of the West, and the theory of the manifest destiny. So the, that the Europeans uh, from the colonies of the East uh, had every right in, and to, to colonize the West. There were people living there, but that's, that's another story. Um, so not only um, 
colors that we could uh, be familiar with that could connect us to the feeling of the sublime, but also with uh, the concept of conquest. And this is, isn't it a little bit what we're trying to do in space as well? So we were in the American West, um, let's uh, stay there with the next body of work, which is, I promise, the last one. Um, some of you might know Trevor Paglin. Uh, for the ones who don't know this series, though, what do you see here? Sky? <laughs> What's the feeling? Calm? Rage. Okay. So, what we see mostly is a beautiful sunset sky, yeah. right? Um, Trevor Piglin was uh, working, uh, is, is an artist who's working on surveillance, military secrets. In this moment, he was photographing um, remote military bases in uh, Nevada and Utah for another project with a telescopic lens. So he was very far, because um, of course you cannot go that, that close. Um, but what he noticed is that he was being spied. And in, uh, is I think it's even harder to see it with a projector, but in every one of these pictures, there's a little speck, like a little black dot. Yeah, no, you can. And it's a drone. It's a drone that's watching us. So the moment we know that, our perception of this image changes completely, and we start to think. You know, it stops just pleasing us aesthetically, and we're forced to think. So I'll close this with, uh, with this quote by Susan Sontag. All understanding begins with our not accepting the world as it appears. And I hope we can speak a little bit. You know, these this very different examples, in, in my mind at least, are all related to, to each other in the way we experience reality through images every day, whether we think about it and we do it with awareness or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Kaya. Uh, I think it's very interesting um, to uh, see what um, Mrs. Kaya explained earlier, especially about how the uh, in our modern and in our modern times that the picture and any of the visual product uh, can be used in various um, meanings and as tools to various. Um, purpose from military to the our like uh, Mrs. Kaya said earlier, the, our conquest of the stars. I think it's very interesting to uh, see the the same pattern with uh, how the colonization of the the frontiers of the um, United States and the colonization, uh, the, the our conquest of the stars. Very for me my, myself is very eye opening okay okay thank you very much uh, mrs kasia and mr zaki now we came to q and a session uh, so um, from uh, audience if you have any question to both of our presenter here you can raise a hand or maybe if you are not confident with your english you can speak in indonesian i will translate it yeah, <laughs> maybe you can speak in Japanese, yeah. <laughs> uh, Surabaya, Bahasa Surabaya. Yeah, you can, I can uh, translate it uh, to both of our uh, uh, presenters. Okay, any question? While, oh yeah, do we have one over there? Ada. Oh, ada. Any question? Yeah. It's a very rare opportunity, guys. So you have to... Mas yeah, while waiting, Mas Angga, uh, while listening to Gaya, I just want to also add a little bit uh, another example coming from Indonesia, because especially with your uh, project Broken Screen, that's the name, right? The one that you work with uh, blind people or in pair visual. It reminds me actually to a brief in 2015, one of the project that is actually showcased also in Biennale Jogja, Jogja Biennale. 
uh, made by the artist named Jonet Suryatmoko. Apparently, currently he's doing his uh, doctorate in New York, too, in New York University. But at the time, he created a project in Indonesian term. It's called Marki Wuto. It's actually uh, Jalan Buta or the pathway of the blind. So what is actually created, because most of the time in this, this is an art biennale, of course, most of this is actually artwork, installation, huge uh, response on the space. Suddenly he created a performance. Performance that invite participation from the audience to experience the artwork guided by a blind actor. Uh, Mas Jonet, we call it Mas Jonet, is a uh, director of a uh, theater company, a group theater. So he worked with actors and, and writer, and one of them eventually he worked with this blind actor. So this blind actor is actually your guide. So whether you have a visual impairment or, or it's like sighted people, then you have to, uh, they provided a blind shield, then you have to hold hand together with the blind. So the, the artist itself is not blind, Jonet, he will just be there, will not interfere, and then it, you would have to follow this uh, blind uh, person, actor, then he is the one who asked us to follow. So it's actually a di an idea of two things he mentioned, I, I just men uh, mentioned here from his statement of the work, about performativity and uh, true experiencing the peristiwa, it's an experiencing an event and to experiencing what is actually being. So when we are sighted people, I can imagine through your project, it's quite similar. We follow him, the act blind actor. We have to describe things through because we cannot see anything. Oh, this is the artwork like this, the shape. Now suddenly other sensory element, I, I was there at the time also follow that. Suddenly my other senses somehow being triggered, right? So I have to rely on touching, I have to rely on other senses. And again, it's also the framing of the artwork follow this blind actor guide. So I think it's quite interesting. I don't know whether he's continue his project or not. I think he's already embarked with other projects, but Margi Wuto might be a good reference as well, similar with your broken screen. And uh, since you, I, I, I don't know whether you are know each other or maybe at some point you're cross-passing, but it's also show how important of your project and many other similar project about we as a sighted people sometimes forget about the way we understand visual images and now we pay attention on that. Yeah, you can uh, take a look on that. Yes, I think it's um, bringing in other senses is, is really useful because uh, people like all primates, um, human beings like all, all primates use sight as a primary sense to experience the world getting the information we need so the in a rational way but other senses are extremely powerful because they act in the in our subconscious more so that's why music sound touch um smell can uh, can have a really strong emotional impact and i think it's it's very useful because our brain in uh, in uh, in Western culture, especially, just follows patterns that that are you know that are set. It's really good to put ourselves in situations where we we put the dynamic upside down and then see what happens. Okay. Oh, any question? Oh, we have two. Uh, yeah. 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 Can do. do we have a microphone over there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Test, test. Um, I have a question to you, Gaia. Um, thank you for the uh, presentation. It was super uh, inspiring because I like to work a lot with uh, different mediums and I see photography only as one tool out of many. And I wanted to ask you, uh, how, t how do you deal with um, the amount of stuff <laughs> that you gather when you work with different mediums uh, for one project and how do you find a balance in seeing what works and what do I really need and what is unnecessary, what can I cut off? Like, for example, when we 
when you have a project and you want to work with video and sound and uh, text and music and uh, photography and all of these things. Um, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> Action <laughs> um, uh, come together in your head, but when in reality maybe it's too much. So yeah, I wanted to ask, how do you find balance? Whenever I'm not working only in photography, ideally I would I like collaboration. Uh, there is no way you can work in photography and video and text and not compromise. In this case, um, I worked by myself in audio and, and photography um, and video because it was I had established a relationship with her. And it was already a very delicate situation, so I could not just be bring someone in she didn't know and say, "Hey, just you know, he he's gonna do a video." Uh, so, but but otherwise, I feel like being more than one brain on uh, on a project really works a lot. It doesn't work for everyone. You need to find the right people, uh, but it brings a, a lot to to the table. Um, then it's also, I think, important, as, aside from an initial mm, assessment of what can make sense to do for a project, like not, not trying to do everything. Maybe, you know, uh, the, you, can, you can work on a project where photography covers a broader spectrum and video covers only one point of view, one part. Not both mediums need to do everything. And so by doing what makes sense um, and not being anxious about getting everything, you, you already do yourself a big favor. And then sometimes you, when you, um, you know, because the editorial industry is collapsing, I think no photographer can make a living just with uh, assignments, and we're forced to apply for grants more and more. And uh, it's a pain a lot of times, but when you do that, you're forced to sit down and write down what are your intentions, uh, why it makes sense to use one medium or another. And also, they, they all have a session, uh, a section uh, about distribution. And I think that's very, very useful um, because, again, it forces you to think. You cannot say, oh, I want to publish in the New York Times. Like, okay, thank you. But, uh, you know, Ninoska doesn't read the New York Times, and her English is very basic. So how can I get to her, for instance? And uh, by asking yourself all your questions and ideally not working alone, it, it makes it a lot easier. Thank you. Okay, we have the next question. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Masaki and Gaya. So I have a question for Masaki. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not following your presentation in the beginning because I'm late. But uh, yeah, the the first question is, uh, I'm really interested about uh, the photo elicitation uh, approach that you have presented. Can you do some simulation or kind of in part practical level of that things? Maybe just giving an example. Uh, of how to do it in the practical level. And the second question is, uh, can we do the photo elicitation approach uh, to perform with ourselves as a subject, and the researcher as, the researcher as a subject? Can we do that? Or maybe the re-photography is also the, the extension of that uh, approach. I don't know. I'm just raising question. Yeah. Thank you, Masaki. Thank you for the question. Uh, spot on observation also, Clara, previously. Um, could you please uh, share my screen again, Mas? Boleh ditayangkan lagi sambil jalan aja. Karena biar Mas Adi juga tengok uh, yang tadi. Do you need help? I can go there. Aman. Oh, yeah. It's locked. Uh, apparently, in the new media, to open this share screen, they need my thumb. Because it's locked with my thumb. <laughs> okay. There you go. Mau 
tapi di oh, langsung aja yang ini kayaknya oh udah tayang belum nah, nanti saya next aja mas next terus sampai saya bilang stop oke okay, to address mas Aji question on the aspect on practical uh, tool keep going next 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 uh, next next I think I can do it from here can I yeah practical level photo elicitation jadi on the photo elicitation the idea is actually the photographs it's to elicitate many other hidden or unnoticed or repress uh, information or stories or trauma or uh, whatever it is oh sorry this one first uh, this ongoing project the newest one funded by the British Museum It's going to be a little bit with the photo elicitation as well, even though the starting point is the document, uh, document, photo documentation. Let me, st- sorry, it's too much. Sebelumnya, ah, uh-uh, sebelumnya lagi, sebelumnya, sebelumnya. Ya, yeah, stop di sini dulu. Uh, setelahnya, ya. Yeah. Uh, Ini uh, because the question is on the practical level. Uh, next, mas. Ya. Yeah. Tahan next, terus tahan dulu. Oke. Okay. Eh, tahan dan di situ. Ya. Yeah. Next. Dah. Stop. <laughs> Just one press. Dah. Udah. Uh, Oke. Okay. When it comes to I think it also address Clara's question. In this particular project, it's going a two years grant. It's going consist, and the British Museum asked me how many gigabyte you are going to collect the material, and it has to be that gigabyte because we have to work with what we call in the. This is actually a combination between artistic approach, media and communication, as well as museology approach. It uh, because we work with the ethno. Uh, at not ethnography but ethnology and ethnographic uh, data collection and our proposal is actually will end up with 120 something gigabyte and they said uh, can you manage yeah i think so <laughs> uh, can we reduce no you have to add because <laughs> because the expectation it's actually about the data itself rather than so when it comes to the practical level again agree with gaia i won't work myself it will be consisted of five uh, member of the team the principal investigator is my colleague who himself not familiar with the photographic practices he himself is more the expert on Aceh the region itself he's been doing on the issue in there after the conflict and the tsunami as well while we end up combine all the focus I'm work be working on the uh, empowerment training So we are going to work to involve young people in Aceh to produce the material. So it started with the training first. So it's kind of like TOT, training of the trainers. So we are going to start with the workshop similar with what you've been doing here in Bromo. And then they will continue with that under our supervision, but quite loose supervision, while our own member will also do the thing because the other one is a videographer is a f- documentary filmmaker but w- we ask him please do not make the logic of documentary film in this case you have to dig data and uh, interview people next mas slide berikutnya uh, we're going to meet the people uh, there next and then when it comes to on the practical level in general not always a huge project like this uh, sometimes it's a simple one mas aji For example, uh, I think, I don't know whether you've been here or not, but before I share uh, an example of working with uh, female teenagers having a traumatic relationship, or maybe not traumatic, but of course, longing of her mom who worked as a migrant worker. So we do the photo elicitation by working with them. I gave an example previously. Uh, just take a picture. So it's the girl who took the pictures In the other project, I work with the youth working on ref, uh, digging the issue on what is actually about art and cultural expression in the neighborhood that they never experienced before. So digging about history of 
art performance in their village. Mm. At the time, I asked them to took any pictures, whatever, without any clue, without any framework for me, both technical, yeah, I mean like technicality, you know to turn on, you know to turn off, you know to press the button, that's it. No lighting structure, no compositional aspect that I told them, make it free. We end up gathering again, we end up with a pile of very interesting images, not in terms of aesthetic and artistic approach, but subject matter. From there, we sat down one by one. Of course, in uh, following the environment that it's nicely structured, we call it in the ethnographic approach and the approach of in situ. I think it's from Latin, ending, yeah, right? You have to put yourself in that situation of your subject. From there, we set one by one. After, of course, we built trust. I asked them, why you took this picture? One guy, in other context of this uh, longing of the mother, it, this one is the context of understanding neighborhood. Why you took this uh, pictures of cow? Who took the pictures of the thing uh, of horses? Thomas, yeah, at the time. The project, <laughs> yeah. It's similar situation, I just, sorry, use that example. And then, this is the cow. Is this is your uh, cattle? In at home? No, 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 this is my neighbor. Yeah? You helping her on the daily basis? So I keep talking, keep talking. If it is okay to be recorded, I ask the consent, okay. Most of the time, no. They are not familiar with all the tools, so I just get rid all my recording material, just make a some note. Sometimes it's just based on uh, remembrance as long as we really dig deeper. And then why you took this picture of cattle? No, oh, this is my neighbors. Okay, you help on a daily basis? No, I never help him. But why you took him? Oh, it's actually, apparently, it's owned by an old couple, empty nester, sudah tidak punya anak lagi di rumah, berdua saja, an empty nester, who's still doing the practice of farming in a very traditional way, no help from the uh, sons or all the kids already moved to other city and this is a very old couple these young people didn't took any single shot of the couple just the cattle one it's only one hand that's the clue apparently and then uh, sorry i have to use this expression in in indonesian at the time because it's quite an expressive too uh, i'm not that feeling comfortable to take the pictures of the old couple I want to cry. It reminds me what would happen to my parents if that happened to me. And then apparently, and then I check on the following day, it's a really old couple. Uh, the lady is already like, apa tu? Macam bungkuk tu. Apa kita put sebut? Uh, already hatch, yeah, hatch, and then require a tools to just to walk, but they still maintain that. And these young people who took the pictures say that, no, enggak tega mas. Then he told the story, and then from there, I compare with my friend who dig deeper other elicitating of the story, and then we just realize this neighborhood is actually consists of empty nester. The farming issue, oh, that neighborhood is also become a tourism village lately, desa wisata. <laughs> with the promotional by the local municipalities, but there is an issue. Who will work on that, rely on this? while all the farming activities and practice become exoticized rather than that's the true livelihood. So this exotization, it started, at the end, we as a researchers write it down on the report about the challenges faced by villager in, in Southern of Java, at the time in the case is in Cirebon, uh, Northern of Java, Bandung, uh, Jogja, and Bantul, and then we talk about that mostly. The photographs not part of the report, but at the end, as a part of a grant, research grant, we want to, this is part of more anthropological and ethnographical uh, ethic. We want all the result can be understood by the in subject too, just like oh, okay. uh, Gaia had that. At the end, even though it's not requested by the grant, we create an event to showcase the image in the village made by the young people talking about it. We invite the old couple, we invite the village leader. It's become a dialogue for them. We didn't 
intervene in the what they are going to talk about, what they are commenting, and mostly, oh, this is you. What this is? Why you took the picture of my kettle? Ah, it's not funny, ah, but I like it. <laughs> Something like that. So, uh, can you please next, Mas? Another example of technicalities and practicalities. Next slide. Yeah, this one. Uh, this one it's more a little bit more beyond this kind of social conflict or anything. It's about the everyday practice of somehow it's maybe a little bit fancy, creative hub, creative collective, creative corner, everything is right. But in this case, my question, Mas Aji, karena kita harus punya pertanyaan di mula bahwa Sorry, now I mix with my Malay. <laughs> I don't know why, because I'm talking, I spent a lot of years there. Because uh, uh, without this question, our digging deeper of interview will also randomly. We won't see the material connected one to another on the analytical aspect. So you have to have this kind of presumption question, even, even though this is not the, f the final, final question of your investigation. But at least we have, we have to have that. In this particular case, the image is completely bad, of course, from any artistic point of view, <laughs> compositional, conceptual, it's hard to be understood because this is just a few images, and I had plenty of this. All the announcement in this creative studio, they're actually talking about practicalities. Who cleaned the toilet? <laughs> On the left, who cleaned the toilet? A, B, C. On the right, it's the price of the drinks on their fridge because they want to have this apa tu, cafe kejujuran, uh, honesty cafe. So everyone just take that and then left the money. Kantin because they, uh, yeah, kantin apa? Kejujuran. Kantin kejujuran, yeah. Uh, the honest, honest uh, cafeteria or something. So to me, it's important. And then I show it to them what kind of practice you have this. And in the bigger pictures at the time, uh, I was building an argument to con uh, become a counter of the so-called practice of startup creative co-working space. <laughs> I have to use the accent <laughs> because it's become buzzword and it's actually speed up. I have to say it out loudly, even though it's on Zoom, it's okay. I, I won't be co I won't be invited anymore by the Ministry of Creative Economy after this. <laughs> this buzzword somehow become a formula like in all the practices of creativity in, in Indonesia and Malaysia. While to me, witnessing, nope, it's not that fancy. It's about daily practice. Who cleaned the toilet in our studio? Who actually pay? Who didn't pay? Who put the price? And who actually being honest? They create this system. <coughs> and then it end up as a sub-chapter talking about uh, I use this uh, quote from them, similar like Gaya, with the title. The quote is, uh, the title of the chapter and then end up as a publication of journal article, it's okay to be slow, quote and quote. It's coming from the inter, uh, interview of elicitation. It's okay to be slow. It's actually a counter to the process of so-called creative economy, creative buzzword, that to them, the real creative and craft people mostly they work in a different strategy, organically from below. Of course, they face problem. Of course, they are struggling at some point, but they keep doing their practice. Coming back to your question, without these two simple or few other similar images like this, I cannot dig deeper. No one told me about that cleaning the toilet in their studio. It's something that actually their principle of doing creativity in their environment. That would be all. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to. No um, audio. Okay. Um, I just wanted to to close with with two reflections. Uh, one comes up from uh, the um, the collaboration with the British Museum in in Ache. It's it's um, about heritage as well, and it made me think of the work of Vincent Moon. He's a French filmmaker with a background in music, who traveled the world for about ten years. Uh, just with one camera and one uh, microphone, asking people, what is it worth 
to record here. And he's, he filmed um, and recorded famous musicians as someone's grandfather in a, in a rural area, uh, with the same, given the same importance to both situations. And that's uh, talking about tools, an example where the tools he had being alone really shaped the way he was able to work because he was working having to record music with one camera uh, he had to pack very very light and so his style became uh, um, with very long shots he he cuts very uh, very rarely uh, because it's very hard to edit you know with uh, with music and so it became very physical and he's he has his handheld style physical he turns uh, turns around the the musician sometimes it it goes on for even 7 minutes and it creates the experience of of being there and another uh, and last thing is um, we both talked a lot about interaction with uh, with people, and I think uh, that's what's really missing, like a completely blind side in the conversation about AI. The reason I started doing photography is because uh, art history on the books didn't enable me enough to uh, go out and have an excuse to read the world around me um, in first person. And I was pathologically shy, and if I hadn't had photography today, I would be a very different person because it gave me a bunch of excuses to be in many situations that I would have never had a reason to, to be in. And uh, I think this understanding in first person um, is opposed to the disconnect that can come from uh, uh, creating other images from existing databases. I'm not saying it's all bad. I think it, it can be very interesting to work with collective memory and imaginations. But if we leave aside photography and the way we get in contact with other people, we get into the same room, we spend hours with them, we go through uh, cultural differences and communication differences, then there's something really important that we're losing. Okay, thank you very much um, from Gaia. And now we have come to the uh, the end of the, our session today. Uh, I just want to say that uh, we hope that all of the audience here be, um, become more inspired because whatever Miss um, Gaia and Mr. Zaki said earlier, I think it's very liberating and inspiring. And we hope that especially for you student uh, that after this you came with um, you know broader horizon and you are ready to do whatever project whatever work uh, you want to do and achieve uh, step by step for um, you know whatever you want to be yeah especially in in terms of photography and visual culture yeah okay thank you very much uh, for all of this attendance thank you mr zaki thank you mr gaya for your time today you, uh, we hope that we can join in other time uh, thank you very much uh, i we still be here for the whole day right Gaya, oh, yes, yeah. you'll still be here so in the informal after during the lunch or anything you want to have chat or anything or more information still be here yes you can ask personally to miss guy and uh, mr zaki uh, it's very rare opportunity okay thank you very much uh, have a good day assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh
tes 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 uh, permisi buat teman-teman uner yang uh, di sini itu apakah ikut sampai sesi selanjutnya ya sampai sore ya yang di situ juga sampai sore ya iya sampai sore nah buat teman-teman uner yang ikut sampai sesi sore mungkin bisa ke meja registrasi untuk mengambil konsumsi tapi makannya tidak boleh dalam ruangan di luar oke makasih
Hello everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So we are on uh, the uh, second uh, last session <laughs> uh, for this uh, afternoon and also for the colloquium on the second day. Uh, me will be uh, playing role as moderator and also speaker <laughs> by the end. Uh, and uh, with us today, uh, there are uh, three speakers. The first uh, that will speak is uh, Tadas uh, Kazakiavikas. Yeah, uh, he's from uh, Lithuania, and the second one uh, will be a speaker uh, Heinrich uh, from uh, Germany. Uh, maybe we can uh, see him uh, online. Hello, Heinrich. Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, so it's nice to meet you. Uh, even though it's online, uh, be it, but uh, thanks for allowing your time. Because I know that uh, right now in Germany it's just uh, early morning, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks uh, for being here. Uh, and the last speaker is me. Uh, uh, and uh, we will start, yeah, uh, directly. Uh, for every pre uh, every presenter, we have uh, around 15 minutes, yeah, for uh, to speak. And then after everyone speaking, we will continue to Q and A session. Okay. Uh, the first one is uh, Tadas. Uh, he's a Lithuanian-born uh, documentary and editorial photographer residing in Fil Vilnius, uh, Lithuania. He's mainly focused uh, uh, in its humanistic direction, individuals and their stories as the principal subject of his photography. Author's work was recognized in numerous awards like World Pass Photo, like uh, Oscar Bana, Lens Culture Exposure Awards, and featured in the British Journal of Photography. Tadas was exhibited in Jimei Ale, China, Exposure uh, Uni Arab Emirates, uh, Le Photo Menales on France, uh, New De La Photo Photography Festival. His work was exhibited in countries including Germany, France, uh, China, United States, United Kingdom, Poland, Slovakia, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Spain, South Korea, Taiwan, and all over the world. I think it's global, yeah? Your work is globally recognized. Uh, he will talk about the title is Subjectivity as a Tool for Visual Integrity in the Digital Era. Okay, Aga, uh, Agas, Agas is my friend. Tadas, uh, the time is yours. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for all for coming. I hope you are not hungry and happy. And I have 15 minutes to talk with you. So I think Today, actually, it's quite interesting to talk in the situation of like digital era. And I would not be the best person, I believe, to talk about digital approaches and digital things. Though I believe uh, it's very much important today to talk about um, actually making it interesting and making it um, important for the people that view them. And uh, me, as a less uh, photojournalist and more artist photographer documentary art, artist photographer I, I think i can talk about subjectivity very much because in some sense it's quite an important thing for me uh, mm -hmm. uh, i would like to talk about subjectivity as a tool for visual integrity in the digital era why it is so important because i think very important is because of uh, very often if we are not photojournalists we do not travel with the uh, editorial um, um, people it's very much uh, often that we raise ourselves a question of creating something on our own and create uh, our own approach uh, so uh, technically i would talk about traditional photography and traditional things uh, why i would do that uh, because i think it's some sort of pattern in lithuania in its uh, own direction of photography and what I would like to start with very quickly to talk about Lithuanian school of photography and its humani humanistic approach. Uh, actually, when you see images from 1950s, 1960s, uh, uh, very often in Soviet Union, uh, we see certain authors that were directed and maybe inspired by some people that worked actually all over the place, I believe in France, in America in 20th century, start of 20th century, and we have these people like Antana Sutkus, uh, Romualdas Pajerskis, uh, Romualdas Rakauskas, um, uh, uh, many, many people, and actually maybe, let's say, seven or eight people, uh, 
were forming some sort of direction that was called Lithuanian School of Photography. It was quite known in Soviet Union and uh, or above, uh, around the, the Iron Curtain, as we say. Uh, and in some sort, because we were so close, uh, technically speaking, we were creating something on, of our own based by the values that uh, many people uh, have. Recording in progress. Hello, thank you. Oh, what to press now? Uh -huh. I'm sorry. So, starting from that, I start to understand that actually it's a pattern that carries through personality as, as me. And when I see these images, I believe I understand very much why I work in certain way. Uh, and why I do this. So maybe I'll try to try to be narrow, but I can't do that actually. I, I, I like to sp speak a lot. Uh, but technically I'll try to st uh, differentiate a few aspects that we want to cover. So it's the culture. And I will start on my photography. Basically I'll try to explain what I mean uh, through subjectivity as a way, as a tool of visual integrity in digital era. Uh, when I think about my work starting from uh, Syria soon to be gone, uh, I start to understand a few things. And actually, maybe just leaving a few images on your screen, I would, uh, I would like to talk a bit about why it's important for me and why I think, uh, especially in the digital era, to talk about something subjectively and not very much like... Um, uh, objectively, which I think, uh, and actually I remember from yesterday that we said that, you know, new objectivity is subjectivity, technically speaking. So why it's so important for me? It's uh, basically, it's material that is initiated by the author themselves. So it means we are super excited to do that. We are very dedicated to do that. We are very, very driven by the idea and the fact. It's like a child, when he starts to do something, he's very driven about that. I think, in some sense, photographers are very often like a children, like th that they like to play with certain things, with visuals, and they start to become so much interested that they lose themselves inside it. Of course, it's always a big problem because you can lose yourself too deep and too much and too wide. But technically, very, very, very often, actually, it's intuitivity of the photographer himself, herself, that drives you to the very, very clear and very, very narrow path that you, you want to tell. Uh, technically, why, why it is so, I think, uh, um, why it is so important is that listening to your inner voice very often creates the situations that w could, could not be covered by the people in the other uh, other places. So, um, I firstly, it's not initiated by editors or magazines, and uh, it's something that you would take as your own route. Uh, why it was so important for me as a as a as a, uh, as a photographer is because actually I lived out of my country for five years. Uh, why why it is so important? Because in some sense, when we always talk about the situation of uh, getting into other countries and losing ourselves in the stories and not knowing what to do, especially uh, if we don't have the right fixers, is very often that we look very um, um, not deep into certain situations. We do not do enough. Uh, in uh, we do not. Uh, how to say, keep enough intel to be very, very clear on the subject. So technically, it's very important for certain people to work in their own areas because they understand the situation so much. Uh, they understand the, the culture so much. They understand the, the, the pattern of the place so, so, so thoroughly that they can be very, very precise and very, very honest and very, very true. Uh, uh, by not actually covering everything in itself, but actually covering just the parts of it. So when I go through these images, I remember my own journey through Lithuania and through Lithuanian villages. Well, I'm always uh, really interested in the, in the places uh, where more rural life is. And uh, very often, it's the place that you can tell more stories, uh, more deep stories, and people are more open to your, um, to your interest. Uh, uh, 
basically, uh, uh, it's very uh, important to think that uh, it's actually the location and the theme that is very dear to you and it's very important to you and you want to tell about it very, very nicely. And it's quite interesting because in certain sense, you become in love with your subject and when you become in love with your subject, there's no way to hurt them because you just can't do that, you can't think about that. And while doing that, actually, you'll understand that even if you work with editorial people, they will not twist your uh, story because you'll be the thorough owner of, of this whole situation. And why I'm saying so is that very often, for example, uh, the work I will show you a bit more later, um, maybe I'll go a bit further in other series I would like to show. Uh, well, it's a jumpy actually situation. But uh, for example, uh, I worked on one of the series that w that is called uh, uh, The Snows of Yesteryear, which is dedicated to the uh, 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 Siberian exile that happened in Lithuania uh, during the Soviet times. Uh, when you think about situations like that, and especially, for example, going into other material like uh, another series I was working on is uh, The Ode to the Last Working Man, which is dedicated actually to the people that work in the factories, is very often that it can be used in certain situations. So you can't, as a owner, sole owner of the images, can't let this happen because let's say why it's so important for me in the situation like factory worker, very often it was taken as a Soviet Union's uh, main person, uh, main uh, um, uh, initiative person that uh, makes the whole Soviet Union so important and so so special is that factory worker is the like the main cog in the society and it makes it all beautiful and nice and uh, wealthy and 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 perspective. But uh, why I I did this uh, in in this situation in my own country is that I understood that because of the sole reason of taking it very uh, ideologically, actually it happens that uh, people do not talk about this theme anymore. They almost avoid people like factory workers. Now, w why it is so important to take care of your images is very often it can be used in different situations. So in this situation especially, uh, these images can be used actually to show the hard living conditions of certain people and it would twist uh, the story for me actually so much and uh, in this uh, in in for example ideology like russia today like belarus today it can be actually used to uh, almost advocate some sort of story of uh, the beauty and niceness of the soviet union that was happening and basically why it should be revived and uh, why it should be important now, uh, when you go through these uh, through these images, actually, to, uh, when you think about the situations like that, it's, uh, it's very often that ideology takes the takes the upper side of the of the of of, of the process. And if you are not uh, taking care of these people, if you are not interested in them so much, if you are not uh, like almost in love with the, your subject. It's very often that you will my, uh, you you might hurt uh, you might hurt by telling the stories, so um, maybe uh, just uh, uh, to look into other situations is, for example, one of the aspects of it as a uh, territory. Uh, while uh, while I was working uh, in uh, uh, why it's so important. Uh, actually to think about territories that uh, one of my series is called Between Two Shores. It was very uh, narrow and very specific strip of land in Lithuania that was um, uh, interesting just because of the territory itself. So uh, uh, by telling the story I wanted it to show very, very clear uh, uh, aspect of uh, why territory is so important in this certain uh, situation. Um, when you w when you see uh, when you see these stories, when you hear these stories, actually, is w uh, you find out them by going into the situation and letting yourself in the certain situation without having the very, very strong plan before. 
So when you uh, when you uh, when you approach these people, when you see them on the spot, you start to think about what you can tell about that. Uh, in this situation, uh, it was very in interesting for me actually, for in uh, as an integrity uh, d uh, in, in in the whole situation to tell uh, why it, it was so important for them to live in this uh, in in this area. Uh, technically, it's uh, it's uh, you can't really plan these things because uh, even though like. Uh, I, I, in this situation, when I came to this country, to Indonesia, it was very, very hard for me to understand how can I plan things, how can I think about plans. And uh, uh, being not a part of editorial team, uh, it's very often that you lose yourself and you need to listen to your inner voice to find out the most important things. So when I went there, when it was... Uh, quite new and quite interesting thing for me. I understood certain things that started to appear in the situation. And it was understanding of these, uh, of these people's way of life, of these people's, uh, uh, mm, why they chose to live in there. Because it's quite a um, uh, deep story of that place. Uh, because it was abandoned after the Second World War and uh, the place was populated with the uh, people uh, that uh, were um, uh, almost like planted in this place to replace the people that were living there, uh, actually German, uh, it was German people that lived there. Uh, so I started to understand why they chose in these places, because it was quite important to them and uh, uh, it was uh, quite um, quite strange to analyze the place, to, to analyze the territory itself, uh, try to understand the situation, try to understand what is the connecting pattern throughout these people? Uh, and by this, I start to understand that one of the most connecting uh, situations is the moments of their uh, some sort of uh, calmness uh, uh, situation. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, in 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 this, I started to portray people with their special places in the Coronian spit. Um, so what what's the actual moral of it is that uh, very often we need to go and to listen to our own feelings of the situation and to listen to the people that help us direct us in the certain situations like uh, fixer uh, fixers that that help us to get into certain uh, areas that would not be able to uh, to see. Um, we need to be open to actually different ways of photography as well, uh, in t in, uh, trying to incorporate other materials, trying to be open, not to be closed just on the visual itself. And it was quite interesting for me to, while I was doing that, to learn certain new um, aspects of it, that uh, it can be uh, even the poem uh, poem books from uh, f uh, 70 years ago that could be part of the of the um, uh, series that I did right here so it's all connected with the location but even the time is not the same so in this situation it becomes like even the story throughout 70 years so you can tell you can tell the story even without the actual images from the past now uh, when you think about uh, territory is uh, again it's very important to find out an angle that uh, it's less obscure and uh, when uh, when when location is very much important and maybe a uh, few of you can uh, tell about bromo already uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's very very specific to not to be too literal but actually to play the situation quite uh, uh, quite uh, personally so what i saw especially in your work that you know you 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 touch the aspects you like even though you tell the story about the place itself uh, now uh, what i kind of uh, understand that uh, for example uh, for me when i came to indonesia as a first moment when i saw the place uh, the Jak jakarta in general uh, of course i didn't spend enough time there but in certain places i was so touched by some sort of intu um, intuition uh, some sort of like inside emotion that i started to understand that actually we should all follow our own um, 
direction to do things what we feel is good and uh, even it might sound a bit vague but very often the honesty and the true interest in the people around and like five minutes okay and true honesty and interest in people around can take you to the very very specific stories so uh, let's say I would not be interested uh, to tell the story about Indonesia in general, uh, but I would be very, very much interested to show the history of Morantia, which is like one fishing village uh, in the in the in the in actually Jakarta themselves. So, by choosing this, you actually have enough time and uh, enough interest. And if you build your interest, uh, as I said, emotionally so much in yourself, almost becoming a child. Uh, ch a child excited about this whole situation, you start to feel that it can be very, very specific to you, and we can tell something very, very narrow. Uh, maybe uh, coming back of uh, uh, to, uh, I'm very sorry to jump through these um, mm, slides so quickly, but maybe for a certain moment, I would like to tell you, oh, what happened? I'm sorry. Um, Sorry about this. Um, I'll come back very quickly because I don't have enough time. But to, to tell about the uh, series of s the snows of yesteryear, uh, it's quite interesting because culturally it's important. So when I tell about my own um, uh, situation, uh, uh, talking about this specific series. I would like to say that it's quite uh, important uh, to tell about your own country stories. Now, it's not very easy to do that because we are very, very much sometimes bored of our own stories about our own roads, about our own villages, about our own people, uh, and maybe even not interested anymore about certain aspects of us. Uh, but actually, it's us that are the best uh, person to tell this and why I'm saying so is that it's the story about Siberian exile it's it's it was told so many times so many uh, so many situations were dedicated to tell the stories about these people but actually if you find the right way right angle to do that it's very very good and it's very very thorough and it's different because it can be shown on a different uh, light uh, the story can be shown on different light so uh, for example, as a as a working situation for me, I try to work on few things. Even though it's it's telling the story about 150,000 people that were taken to Siberia, to to the gulags, to the uh, harsh conditions. Uh, technically, if I would start to talk about this whole series just on itself, it would be not very uh, honest picture because I would want to tell it all except actually i would not tell anything because it would be vague enough to be uh, to try to tell everything but not specifically something so what i did is actually i tried to find uh, one story that was so important for me because it came through my life i started to read this book and actually one thing that appeared throughout the book that was um, the phrase of this uh, uh, the the the, the, the the train of orphans what i started to understand that uh, this is the story because uh, i started to hear this as my intuition and it started to be very very specific for me so what i did i started to look into the story of 250 children that were taken back from siberian exile um, uh, to repatriate to lithuania which was quite under uh, ununderstandable actually why it should be done in soviet union now uh, I couldn't tell the story sadly, and I wanted to actually talk about that with a with a nice sunny feeling about that. So what I did is actually I found these children and I talked with them. But what we did is actually we went to these places that were they taken from, and to make their portraits actually in the situations where they would feel some sort of emotional um, aspect to that. So. It was uh, it was uh, it was some sort of uh, different angle to tell the same story again and again, and when we sometimes analyze that uh, we would not like to talk about uh, villages, we would not like to talk about certain historical things. 
I think it's very, very much important that we should think about these things, but ve try to put that into our own subjective way, to find out the most interesting way and to convince ourselves that it would be interesting for us. If it would be interesting for us, technically, the viewer will see it very, very interestingly as well. And it was proven quite many times that actually it works so much by making subjectivity in, in your own stories, by making it your own, uh, your own, technically, you would interest people around you as well. And they would see what you put in the, these pic pictures. Uh, you, they will feel the energy that you put inside. So I, I really would like to wish you all to find your inner voice and your inner happiness and your inner subjectivity and to turn into power that would carry along uh, in your ways, uh, especially talking about students. I Thank think you. I'll finish with that. Thank you very much. Have a round of applause, everyone, for Tadas. And he's so insightful. And we will go to the second speaker. Uh, hi, Heinrich Holtgriff. Heinrich, are you there? Yes, hello. Yes, and thanks uh, uh, for being here. Uh, I will read your bio, yeah? Uh, Heinrich Hautgrave is a documentary photographer, lecturer, and podcaster from Hamburg, Germany. He was born in 1987 in Bochum, uh, Germany. Heinrich studied uh, photography at the University of Applied Sciences, Bielefeld, Germany, at the uh, Chung An University, Seoul, South Korea. Since 2016, he is a member of Berlin-based agency Oscars. His long-term photography project, The Internet as a Place, leads him to different countries exploring the physical realities of the Internet's infrastructure. He co-hosts the podcast Internet Explorers, uh, and Henry is commissioned a work has been widely uh, published in journalist outlet, journalistic outlets. Yeah. He is currently lecturing in Berlin, Oskarotsu, and Bremen, University of the Arts, on topics of photography and technology. Heinrich, yes, uh, yes, you have appeared on uh, at our screen. Please uh, start. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, would it be possible, um, maybe for Taras to to turn around his laptop so I can see the audience? It's really strange to not yeah. see the audience. The you can see also from the screen that uh, supplied by the uh, operator as well. You can oh. see it from your Zoom? Uh, not yet, no. I just want to see who, who am I talking to, you know? Yeah, you can see. Uh, please hold on, yeah? It's from Unisas Airlangga, if you can see it on the screen uh, above you. Uh, I can see three white chairs, and I think it's you who is talking. Yeah, it's no? me. The one with the white shirt and uh, not that handsome fa uh, face. <laughs> <laughs> no. Not yet? Okay. We will go through that uh, and please, uh, you can start. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, so, again, uh, thanks for having me. And as you said, it's early morning in Germany, so my voice might be a little rough. Uh, still, I woke up um, half an hour ago. Oh, yeah, there I see some people in a classroom situation. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Um, well, um, now let me share my screen, if that's possible. So it's around 500 people, 500,000 people attending. <laughs> yes. So I prepared the lecture, Artificial Intelligence, the Human Labor Behind the Human Interface. Mm. And I prepared this uh, this little mind map sort of thing, but uh, start. Let's start from from the top. And the top is I asked the tool Midjourney, which is one of those AI tools, uh, to imagine you. That's what I. That's why I was insisting on wanting to check if if Midjourney did a good job. So I asked Midjourney the prompt. A group of 20 students from Germany, France, and Indonesia are sitting in a conference room in Surabaya, Indonesia, with local furnishings. And this is what the AI came up with. So why am I showing this? Because um, I didn't tell the AI anything about how you looked or what skin tone you have, what gender you have, whatever. And this 
this is what it came up with. Uh, it's just assumptions, assumptions about your people, about your age, about the room, about the furnishing. And if I see correctly, it's way too brown compared to your reality right now and too, too cozy even. Your, your room is really more like a, like a school place, but um, no offense anyway. Um, so this is for, uh, for an intro. Um, there are, where we are we? Uh, AI in movies and TV. Let's do a quick tour through that historically. There are utopian depictions of AI, and it's stuff like like this guy, Data. Um, I was born in the 80s, in 87, and uh, in the 90s I grew up with watching Star Trek Next Generation, and maybe some of you remember this guy too. It's obviously a human actor, but he was playing a robot with uh, super highly developed artificial intelligence and managing a spaceship or uh, even engaging in combat sometimes and he was always this very nice and very straight to the point very unironic guy who always wanted to do good things then we have this movie i think this is even more popular and I also put this in the utopian, like in the positive outlook, the movie Her. But the last time I, I held this workshop, uh, people told me mm, Her is not really utopian, it's dystopian, because this guy fell in love with his computer right there. And why is that utopian? Why is that the future we would want? But anyway, I, I, I thought it's a, it's a nice romantic movie, so I put it in utopian usage of AI. Um, then it's the examples for dystopian um, movies, and of course we can't we can't skip two thousand one, a space odyssey. It's made in the sixties by Stanley Kubrick, and I couldn't decide for just one picture, but I needed more because it's so iconic and so such a great cinematography. Um, and this is the star of the show. Um, this is Hell. H-A-L, um, a computer or an artificial intelligence symbolized by this interface, this red light and this gray box. And this machine suddenly decides to not, not abide the humans and to kill the humans in the end. Which is a spoiler, I know, but uh, there's way more going on in the movie if you haven't seen it. Then, of course, we have The Matrix, Mr. Anderson, uh, a personified uh, entity of AI and the computer, uh, hunting down Neo and everybody else of the, of the good guys. And then, of course, The ter Terminator, which is an analogy that's quite often used, even, even uh, on, a, on an aesthetic level, I think. If you if you if you're doing a Google image search of AI, you will mostly see uh, robotic people, which admittedly don't look as frightening as this guy, but you get you get the idea. So there's also a utopian and dystopian take on what AI is basically, and there I want to show a video and. I hope if you hear me, you also will hear my computer's audio. Um, please interrupt if it doesn't work. Hi, uh, Heinrich. Uh, your voice is not. We cannot hear your voice. Your my voice. Uh, so you video, can't hear it. Yeah, the video uh, voice is not apparently not working. 
Oh, okay. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, well, so we have to improvise. So you would hear, uh, you would hear a female voice uh, explaining that um, AI is a very uh, just a technology, and there is a pattern recognition and. Uh, making predictions and recommending actions, and it's all very late, late burn, very, um, how to say, in a very uh, bare bones, a very objective way, in a very technolo technological way. Um, oh, this shakes up my, my, my thing a little, because I wanted to also show you um, a take by by this lady called Meredith Whitaker. I can even I can show you how she looks and how the setup is where she spoke. But this is this is um, the person, and sh she was giving a lecture in in Berlin-based Republika. And that lady is uh, remarkable because she is. Uh, First and foremost, she's the the head of the Signal Messenger. Maybe you know it. It's the the blue the blue icon. It's not WhatsApp. It's not uh, Facebook Messenger. It's the Signal Messenger, it's, and it's used by people who care about privacy because it's fully encrypted. And she was um, for I think twelve years. Uh, she was working at Google, and she was involved in the early stages of Google's AI involvement. Um, it was. 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago even. And while she was working there, she got this uh, co-worker who pitched an idea to her. Hey, how about we at Google, we, de we de develop an AI which will, will be able to um, to foresee genocide, <laughs> to predict genocide. And she was like, wait a minute, uh, what? A machine that can predict genocide? And what is genocide? How do we define it? How? Which data points do we need to sniff out in which country there's going to be a genocide and she was that raised her eyebrow and she became a skeptic and that was 10 years ago and she um, she uh, she fought or she she challenged um, from within Google um, their AI um, um, approaches and she, uh, she eventually uh, quit and became a pol political advisor and uh, I think since a year she's the head of Signal. So that's her and her position is artificial intelligence is just a marketing term. It's not something you can um, objectively describe as this is a technology and this is doing just this. But artificial intelligence as a term is uh, more of a more of a label than a real technology. It's uh, its origins um, stem from, I think it was the 60s, she says in her uh, talk. Um, sorry, I have to to, um, to improvise uh, her talk, what she's saying. Um, and the, the, the scientist who coined the term, he needed something to differentiate himself from a topic, from a term that was popular during the day, and that was cybernetics. So. 60 years ago, people, when they spoke about this kind of technology, uh, technology, they used the term cybernetics. But there was this other team, so to speak, and they didn't want to have anything to do with cybernetics, so they coined the term artificial intelligence. Why? Because they needed a, a term and a, a nice label to, to get money to fund their... Uh, uh, their programs at university. So it's a very, um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, uh, it's not it's not really magical what happened there. It's um, it's also very military driven. That's what she's also saying. That it's um, a term and a technology that always has a always had a very um, intrinsic uh, connection to military interests and controlling data, controlling people and everything. So utopian dystopian. You, s you probably saw these things, Google Captures, where I have to select these images in order to log in or something. And what you probably didn't know is that we, me included, we always trained AI while doing this. So this is a service by Google which feeds this feedback 
into training training data and labeling data. So we as humans help the AI to to be sure that this is a statue, this is a statue, and this is a statue. And this is a classic image, and more recent ones look totally different. Like I screenshotted this in June 23. And here we suddenly uh, have to click each image containing something you can drink, and which is uh, on another level. Like, I mean, of course, it's easy for humans, but it's on, a, on another level for computers. Um, a statue is, I don't know, a gray human-like figure, but something you can drink. It can be in a glass. It can be in a sea. It can be coming from the tap. You know, it's very. Um, it's not very clear visually. And of course, you cannot drink a dog, so it's easy. But anyway, uh, or um, click on the tractor, click on each image that um, has a tractor. And we know as humans, this is a heli helicopter, not a tractor. But again, every time we see this, we train uh, Google a Google's AI and we are workers for them without any compensation. And of course, AI is built in everything we use today as photographers. And iPhone is full of AI um, subject detection, for example. Uh, Photoshop and Lightroom gained many AI abilities. Just, I think, yesterday, um, the Photoshop version uh, that became famous as the Photoshop beta it came out of beta and became the official photo Photoshop uh, version 2024. If you have a Creative Cloud Abo uh, uh, a subscription, you will have all these new AI features within Photoshop. And so um, I think I'm going to skip this part because I think everybody knows there's prompt to text tools and prompt to image tools like GPT is prompt to text and Midjourney is prompt to image. And you can do funny stuff or I don't know, important stuff like. Uh, generate the tortoise on wheels. That's what I saw yesterday on, on, on in mid journey because it's, it's a public thing. And I was amazed by the, the length of the prompt. A color photo of a tortoise with wheels would be a fascinating set of work. The, ima the image would showcase a tortoise, a symbol of slow, steady movement equipped with wheels, adding a touch of unexpected mobility to its nature, blah, 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 blah. And even camera model and lens and macro photography and then directors, Wes Anderson, <laughs> Roger Deakins, cinematographer, photographers, National Geographic, Tim Walker, fashion designers, Iris Van Herpen, Alexander McQueen, whatever. I think the guy who prompted this um, was a real control freak. I don't know if he, he was happy or she was happy with this image. Um, so there's an AI arms race. It's uh, these companies here. We all know them. OpenAI is the, the owner of ChatGPT and Dolly. And Microsoft invested 11 billion in OpenAI, so they're kind of uh, married right now, now, I would say. And ChatGPT is incorporated in the Bing chatbot since half a year. Then there's Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp. They have their own AI, the, at least the, the language AI. There are many more AIs, but the language model AI. Google has Bard, Amazon has Alexa, which will become even more AI-centric in the future. And also, crucially, Amazon runs the internet, basically. Amazon is not, is not only the, the, the website you, or the app you use or the Alexa you use or the whatever, the Prime Video music, all these things. This is basically the, the, the customer-facing side of Amazon, what, what their uh, main thing is, I would say, is the AWS, the Amazon Web Services, and this is data centers around the world. They are the infrastructure and the, let's call them the, the hotel of the of the internet, where uh, clients like, like most websites use Amazon servers to, to, to operate. It includes, uh, includes the new AI companies. And if you remember Edward Snowden, uh, you remember that um, this is the guy in 2011 or no 12 was it? Uh, he he leaked the NSI insights that uh, NSI NSA insights that um, most traffic is like soaked up and vacuumed up by the 
national uh, security intelligence agencies by by the, the five eyes usa england new zealand australia and the fifth one i forgot maybe france anyway and also nvidia is part of the uh, arms race because they produce the gpus the, the graphics cards which are used to to train and to, to operate the ai models and if we have a quick look at this website is called Infinite Market Cap. We see that uh, so uh, people who are not into stock trading might need an explainer. So uh, market cap is the market capitalization. And this is the, the amount of money that people around the world have put into these companies if they buy stocks. So the, the asset with the highest market cap in the world is gold, 12.7 trillion. Uh, Apple is in uh, second place, 2.7, then Microsoft, 2.5. Saudi Aramco, the uh, state-owned oil company from Saudi Arabia, is uh, fourth place. Then Google, Alphabet, Amazon, then Silver. And then already NVIDIA, it's the eighth, eighth most valuable company in the world. And Tesla, nine. And Meta on uh, place 11. So I wanted to show you this to make sure that you know that these companies run the world basically. <laughs> they, um, they influence what we do, what we see, what we buy, what we don't buy every day. And, and it's most likely that we, uh, you and I, we use these um, some way of the another. So getting to the core of my um, talk. I know it's already time is running out, but let's do this. Um, how is the AI trained? Mm. You might think it's magic and images like these make us think it's magic because it's these shiny robots and they're doing the work. The AI is, and the AI is intelligent. Humans will lose their jobs, blah, blah, blah. But it couldn't be farther from the truth. It takes people, a lot of people, and I would have loved to show you another clip of her speech because it's she's such a nice speaker and she's got all the she's got all the facts. But uh, what she what the the portion I was showing you about to show you is she explains how the ImageNet data set ImageNet is a, a scientific project where images were uh, like. 14 million images were put into a basket, digital basket, and needed to be labeled in order to create a very early visual artificial intelligence. And if they had worked with students only, with, like with humans, like human students, because they needed uh, students to tell um, ImageNet, this is a tree, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is warm, cold, you know, everything we as humans have learned since day one, basically, uh, machines needed to learn, and they didn't learn it by themselves, they learned it by humans. But there were so many images in this image set, data set, that if they had worked with students only, they would have taken 19 years. So, and they were about to say, oh, come on, we can't do it, let's scrap it, it's impossible. And then um, they had this chance encounter at the, I don't know, at the photocopier or something. Um, and the student said to the instructor, hey, there's this Amazon platform, it's called uh, MTurk, we should use it. And oh, okay, let's use it. And this is, uh, M Amazon MTurk is, oh, I can show you, it's uh, mturk.com. This is another platform by Amazon, which is less lesser known, I think. And there you can be a requester or a worker. So why is it called MTurk? It's the short for Mechanical Turk. It's a, a silly invention from 1769. And it's this puppet that's dressed to look like a stereotypical Turk in a weird way. And the inventor said, oh, look at this. This can play chess all by its own. And um, Apparently it could, but 
Um, eventually it became known that it's a fake, an elaborate fake, because it was dressed as a machine, but inside the wooden box there was a human doing all the chess playing. And this, what, this is what it looked like from inside. The human inside the machine. And this anal analogy uh, is used by Amazon to describe the Amateur platform. The machines are nothing without humans um, teaching them. And if you do a search on uh, YouTube, on MTurk, you will see these videos of, I would call it the, the gig economy hell. The gig economy is um, people who work at MTurk or who work at, um, I don't know, Uber or at um, food delivery services who only earn money if they work. And if they're sick, they don't earn money. This is, uh, for me, <laughs> as a German citizen with a welfare state, uh, a terrible thing, but I know it's also a privileged position. Um, and lastly, um, AI also needs to be moderated. And there's this, I think, for people who research AI, this became a famous article in the uh, <coughs> Time magazine. Um, it's from Billy Perigo from January 18th. 2023. Um, OpenAI used Kenyan workers on less than $2 per hour to make ChatGPT less toxic. And this is another, let's call it dirty work that was outsourced from sunny California, where the 10 or what, how many companies? Eight companies, the, the eight highly uh, valued companies in the world reside, and they outsourced the dirty work to not only workers on MTurk, but um, also to, for example, Kenyan workers who earn very little money for what? They looked at sex, sexual abuse pictures or videos or harassment or violence or blood and everything like the, the worst trash from the darkest corners of the internet for eight hours or even more hours a day and received two dollars as compensation. And I think a $70 extra for um, or sensitive work. So, but it's not the only class, so to speak. It's not only the working class who is, um, who is, um, how to say, um, who is fucked, <laughs> uh, as always, or as, as that class is used to. This time with AI, it's also us, the academics, because we as photographers or aspiring photographers or photojournalists, we need a working copyright law in order to, to get royalties and to get money, to get paid. And this is also severely undermined by AI. And this is an example image. This was generated by um, Stability AI. And it shows this, this crowd of people, but inside the output, they, uh, the generator generated the Getty Images watermark. So it's clear as day um, that Stability scraped all the watermarked and copyrighted material from Getty and Getty sued them. I am looking forward to, to that lawsuit. And if you want to check um, if you've been included in those AI um, affairs, you can go to a website called Have I Been Trained? Trained. It's uh, it's it's uh, the same concept of Have I Been Owned? It's a website where you can check whether your email is um, compromised. But Have I Been Trained dot com looks like this. Oops. It's the simple interface. You can upload an image or enter a name, and then. 5.8 billion images used to train popular AI art models will be searched. And it enables you or us um, to opt out. And over 1.4 billion images have been opted out already. Opt out means, hey, AI companies, I don't want to be included. I don't want you to make money off of my work. Be out of it, please. Um, to sum it up, it's, I would say, uh, it's a rehash and a, a new stage of the old blue collar with versus white collar thing. It's 
these terms are used in, in the US English, I would think. Uh, blue collar is the, the factory worker, the, the working class, and the white collar is the, the academic world. And I think it's fascinating that AI fucks both um, um, back then, like when the steam machine was founded, usually it was uh, workers who lost their jobs, but this time maybe we're both uh, worse off than we were before. And I like this meme or this, this thing I found on, on Twitter. What's your favorite tech innovation? Is it an illegal cab company? which is Uber, is it an illegal hotel chain, with it, which is Airbnb, or is it fake money for criminals, which is Bitcoin, or is it a plagiarism machine, which is AI, and this sums it up pretty nicely for me, because uh, as you may have uh, noticed by now, I'm pretty skeptic of all these um, developments, because they're exploiting peoples, or in the, in the case of Airbnb, they're exploiting cities. Um, and also I like this one, <laughs> humans doing the hard, hard jobs on minimum wage while the robots write poetry and paint is not the future I wanted. And I, I hope we can, we can agree on that because we are in the creative industry and wouldn't it be nice if we, as humans continued to be the guys and girls being creative. Yeah, so let's close with this claim, better images. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining the smiley. Uh, better images. And there's this, I hope it's, uh, it can be, you can see it as a positive outlook. Better images of AI. <laughs> this is uh, an NGO or a, a, um, an, I don't know, a, a team or a, how do you say in English, um, um, a movement that wants to to better illustrate AI in the media. Have you noticed that news stories and marketing material about AI are typically illustrated with cliched and misleading images? Human-ed robots, glowing brains, outstretched, outstretched robot hands, blue backgrounds, and the Terminator. These stereotypes are not just overworked, they can be surprisingly unhelpful. And if anybody of you is interested in, um, so let me st stop my sharing. Um, if ever anybody of you is interested in pursuing your um, photography and your way of approaching things in this direction, I would be more than happy to find better images of AI. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Heinrich. This is. Uh so important and also uh, is intriguing, intriguing us yeah, in terms of having the discussion on AI and how it can uh, contribute to the uh, creative industry. Sorry? Yeah, okay, good. And uh, my turn now. <laughs> uh, I will be the last uh, speaker. Uh, so my um, speak is about uh, what happened in Indonesia. So uh, when we are uh, approaching the issue, uh, the first one with Tadas is from the perspective of how the photography uh, working and also keeping the integrity. I think we all uh, agree about that. And when uh, Heinrich talked uh, more about uh, how uh, artificial intelligence put an important role, uh, play an important role in terms of having this uh, situation on creative industry and how it affects many people, not only on working class, but also on blue collar uh, people. Uh, I think it, uh, it will be also important to discuss about it. And uh, I will share about what happened in uh, Indonesia in terms of having this visual integrity uh, and putting this into uh, important consideration on how uh, it uh, mainly uh, performed through social media. Uh, Dimas, can you start? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, social media can actually have its uh, power in powerful impact, yeah, in empowering people, in uh, discussing about many things, yeah, and also enforcing uh, some certain of ideas used as a propaganda as well uh, by everyone, by the government, by the social uh, activists. Yeah, it can also become uh, a, a place or a uh, landmark that can actually. Uh, move people 
uh, to think about one thing to another and also to uh, having this uh, important agenda to be uh, uh, discussed uh, seriously or even in terms of humor yeah uh, i will discuss about that further next slide uh, visual integrity on social media uh, refers to the uh, authenticity yeah the accuracy yeah and ethical use of image and video shared on these platforms. Uh, maintaining visual integrity is crucial in preventing the spread of misinformation, fake news, and har harmful content. Uh, and, I, I, and I see this as something that uh, people used to uh, do on their daily, uh, daily activities. Yeah? Start early in the morning when uh, we are waking up, we try to check what things did I miss from my social media whether it is something that my friend posted or they're tagging me yeah or i just want to see a cute cat <laughs> doing their activities online uh, by like playing with something and and uh, yeah it's something that can make our day as simple as that but it's actually also about how we perceive information and how we believe about this information that being uh, pushed to us or maybe uh, text to us because uh, other people think it is important for us as well. For Indonesian people, for example, we are relying heavily on this communication uh, platform called WhatsApp. And I think on several countries as well, uh, we, re we rely heavily on that. Start from uh, discussing uh, little talks uh, to the exchange of documents, important documents, maybe something that uh, in the document said that it is strictly confidential, but you share it <laughs> easily through WhatsApp. Yeah. yeah, so this is something that we did uh, every day. We do every day and uh, actually this is part of our daily life. Next slide. Talking about uh, visual integrity, we also think about how it is also become uh, a part of our uh, conversation like this one, the deep fakes and misleading videos. Yeah. Uh, we have seen uh, in Indonesian context yeah, how uh, pictures can be uh, used and manipulated yeah, and it can be shared without even further information or limited information or no information at all and let the audience share it, reshare it and put the captions as easy as they want or as they would like it to be. Just like on the first picture over here, this is a screenshot of an Indonesian, uh, are, uh, Indonesian people who uh, like to see Gal Gadot, yeah, but uh, in different version, and because it is deep fake, means that Gal Gadot can be anyone, and especially correlated with the porn, uh, porn videos, porn pictures, and it can be uh, just shared to you via link on WhatsApp, and suddenly your phone just dead. <laughs> because a virus come in, uh, inside your, uh, your, your uh, smartphones. Or there are other things that actually become known as a, uh, a uh, part of a project done by an artist, the one on the second photo, where this is a very famous politician. And Indonesian politician, uh, like it, it, uh, he was hugged by the Hollywood actress. This is something that very impossible according to people who know them but this is something that also possible for people who just really want to think that this man is very naughty yeah? uh, sh uh, he uh, can do anything especially like this one he play with the hollywood actress so people can think also about that but it's actually deep fake so uh Continuing what has been pointed behind it, I think this is something that also being played out just way before we know the uh, kind of uh, uh, the term of deepfake itself. People try to uh, make fun with pictures, but because it was transferred through uh, the so, uh, digital platform, people with different kind of literacy can actually also say and also think about what they want to think and what they want to believe. I'll go further. Next slide. We see, we see from this one. This is very famous. Yeah, uh, our uh, president, current president Joko Widodo. This picture has been way uh, 
played well played yeah by his uh, opponents especially yeah to talk about Joko Widodo uh, was someone that actually coming from this punk culture because this both photo is actually made and produced by an artist uh, his name is Aga uh, his name is uh, Agan Harhap yeah Agan made this picture and uh, he he played this very, very well and just look like something that is really really uh, genuine and this uh, photo used to uh, the manipulation of the photo and he already said that this is manipulated yeah this is for something of creative arts he actually have uh, his uh, uh, exhibition in Jakarta on uh, the the manipulated photos including the previous what including the previous one so this is like the younger days of Joko Widodo yeah with the punk style even though it is fake so instances where image are manipulated to deceive viewers have been a recru uh, recurring issue even though it is not uh, it is produced yeah by someone who are in arts yeah uh, creativity but when it is used and transferred through social media it will be different in terms of meanings and this would actually happen in Indonesia especially during the political years not only political years but also by people who just don't want uh, anything to uh, be uh, so positive about a current leader next slide this is also something that very uh, interesting to play out with the stickers yeah in what uh, whatsapp we have stickers and we use it to exchange our expression not only by using uh, the uh, uh, emoticon but also stickers I have collections of stickers that I collected from my friends as well yeah I, and I'm sure my friends are here also are having this kind of collection of stickers something that uh, started from this normal kind of emoticons yeah and ranging uh, uh, depend on which group that we are uh, living in <laughs> And we put these uh, different kind of stickers and uh, a GIF as well, GIF, yeah. Also short movie that put on the sticker as well. So people can think that uh, this is uh, something that we would like to express uh, through the stickers. Uh, but this is something uh, also become a serious issue in terms of integrity because it, considering through the uh, photo theft, it is also manipulation and unauthorized use. People are just like taking photos from their friends and put like, for example, uh, I have this very crazy WhatsApp group, yeah, that actually uh, put uh, uh, and also uh, copy the uh, picture of our friend, yeah, which is like smiling or sleeping and use the words over that, uh, like for example, uh, of uh, him sleeping, just like put z z z z z z like yeah uh, tidur pulas yeah something like that that sleeping in a good position or maybe when uh, he uh, had something in his mouth you know, and then just take picture and then put words on it so this is something also very popular in this uh, uh, era yeah in contemporary indonesia where people doing their creativity through stickers through uh, emoticon that can they can made it by themselves and uh, share it uh, with friends without knowing further about the issue of copyright for example without having any sensitivity about this can make you uh, be in trouble for example because you are uh, having this uh, issue with copyrights stickers memes satirical content is something that uh, um, uh, distributed uh, a lot yeah, uh, on our daily conversation and use of filters and filters effect yeah uh, also become important uh, in terms of people who like to be exist every day but as you know the face is actually really really smooth because of the filter effect that done all over again yeah uh, on their photos on Instagram on their photos on uh, 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 social, other social media especially like TikTok the one that uh, is uh, uh, really really popular in Indonesia and I'm sure it's also on other country so the use of stickers the, the use of uh, also filters uh, it is actually one of a uh, uh, thing that we discuss uh, uh, in the faculty about how stickers can actually uh, give a different perception and give different meanings on people uh, who like to be recognized yeah well yeah especially like right now we have the political year you need to 
be the the face uh, as what we call it uh, the face need to be paripurna or perfect yeah no uh, acne yeah <laughs> it's just like so smooth yeah uh, for the political uh, uh, party uh, uh, member or candidates yeah next one it is also something that uh, put the danger uh, into how we perceive information especially with uh, people uh, who who are having this unlimited access through the internet but limited literacy yeah like this one it is a fake video uh, because uh, it is something that need to be clarified and it is uh, it is something that fake as well and it used to be goes with the caption especially with uh, capital words yeah like this one this is in indonesian warning Uh, I, I, I read it in Indonesia. Wow, ternyata produksi beras sintetis beras palsu. It is fake uh, rice, yeah, uh, from uh, Chinese Republic has been sent to Indonesia and distributed widely. This is for some people. This is something that can be used to attack the government, yeah, to put negative words to criticize what that has been done by the government. But it's actually based on a fake picture. That actually not uh, contextual, but it's just used for a textual purpose. Yeah. So this is something that very common. Yeah, we know that uh, previously, start from the history. Yeah, the previous uh, uh, previous uh, uh, version of text messages like SMS, short message services. I receive like something that uh, this message is coming from the uh, ulama in Makkah, Saudi Arabia. You need to be uh, on your five times daily prayer. Yeah, if you're not uh, sending this message to another people, you will go to hell. Something like that. And this is common for Indonesia uh, for people uh, to receive SMS, short message service, and it's done over and over again. Yeah, some people say, "Oh, so we don't have to care about," but some people just say that. I just forwarded it from my friend, and I don't know about whether it's wrong or right. But it's always seemed the same or default kind of situation. Uh, but it actually make uh, the situation getting worse because it is distributed over and over again. Next slide. And this one, uh, viral false claim like this one. We always be wowed, yeah, by the, uh, for example, the last video is about uh, the plane. That actually uh, having uh, I discussed it with Panisa uh, the uh, the plane that uh, have smoke and uh, fire on on the uh, on, on the jet there, and it's something that can be used. The true uh, incident is in Singapore where the flight from China go to uh, Singapore and they have this problem. But actually, can be uh, the clip can be uh, uh, used and to give another content. On another context, and it's, it's just like make people confused, like this one. This is something that uh, happened few decades ago, but it is used to uh, be put on the context on something that uh, you or make as it is happen happen uh, in current situation. So, viral claims, especially when people didn't think much, yeah, just forward, forward, forward. It is something that got uh, make situation get got worse. Especially with uh, Indonesian context, contemporary Indonesia that still having problem with the digital gap means that the access of information, the access of the internet is still uh, become a good gap between like like here in Surabaya, big city. It is very different with uh, people who live in on islands, for example. They receive limited information not because they cannot get information, but because the uh, frequency or the um, The network is not coming to them, so that's why Indonesian government would like to have the access to all people, yeah, by having this uh, building of towers in different places, or even the current situation where Starlink through, uh, yeah, the uh, SpaceX through Starlink would like to give access to satellites to have the connection to uh, remote uh, areas in Indonesia, to sm uh, make uh, the digital gap smaller. So, uh, this is uh, something that. Uh, make people uh, think and also not to think about how to forward information to other people. Next slide. But fortunately, we have this activism also performed yeah, by people who like to make uh, 
and also supply information about how facts need to be checked. Like this, can uh, Dimas, can you? Yeah, we will, we will see for the check factor like this one. Okay, can it be displayed? Right, this one. This is one website dedicated, and it's, uh, it is uh, uh, performed by different organization. Started from a, uh, from a news outlet until individuals. They are using this to give information about something that uh, used to be hang around the social media, but it need to be checked further. Like this one, for example. This is in Indonesia. I will translate it. Yeah. Uh, tidak benar dalam foto ini Anis Baswedan menjadi pastor. It is not true that Anis Baswedan become a pastor. Uh, Anis Baswedan is the presidential candidate. Yeah, he's one of the uh, uh, president candidate in Indonesia that will be on a, a race to presidency in uh, 2024. So the information used to be hang around between the issue of religion, religiosity, yeah, nationalism, yeah. Especially this one, Anis uh, has been pictured as someone that has been uh, baptized in one church in Jakarta. And this website, the Check Fakta website, put uh, the uh, context more. And describing about the picture was taken during another occasion where Anis, for example, uh, become the guest uh, of uh, one of the uh, ceremony uh, in Jakarta in one of the church but not being baptized yeah this is uh, how they try to make the fact look uh, and can be uh, used uh, by people to check more we can see for another one um, just one more on check fakta so it is used uh, to to check as well about the hoaxes yeah yeah so as you can see from the visual, it needs also a very blatant kind of uh, symbol, like the arrow, like the red use, yeah, uh, red color use, is to make people uh, get the information easier. Yeah, and this is also in need of having the same or the counter narrative that played and used by the people who like to throw hoaxes because it is organized. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and sometimes also done by individuals and they are using this kind of picture as well so to understand one issue people also need to see and also speak with the same uh, uh, this, this kind of same way yeah okay uh, this is one of the uh, 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 thing that uh, used by check fakta we go back to the uh, presentation <coughs> so uh, we see that in Indonesia, they're also uh, having this uh, contemporary issue on how the visual play a very important role in making people uh, understand and believe about one fact to another. We also have this uh, check fakta by Kompas. It's also run uh, by uh, individually by a newspaper company. Next one. And we also have, uh, the Indonesia also have this uh, law on uh, stricting people in doing uh, things that uh, on negative side, like this uh, policy on ITE. And in 2016, they, uh, the government and also the representative uh, would like to change this, would like to update this, but only something that only on the discourse level, not happening right now. And also currently in 2023, the government would like to have this Indonesia publishers right yeah, to make sure that the digital platform pays for news published through social media yeah for its copyrights and also about business to business relations because it, it is heavily uh, commodified but without further allocation on the rules like the latest uh, one of the ministry said that tiktok should not sell things on their social media tiktok supposed to be social media not become a, a, an e-commerce as what they've done with TikTok shop. Yeah, so this is one also uh, uh, one of the uh, issue that happened. And also about the digital algo algorithms. And this issue has been discussed uh, for the past three years, but until now, the government uh, still haven't got the draft on the rules itself. So we can see the complexity of 
the issue and how different uh, part uh, still try to hold uh, their uh, uh, opinion so it can be in a greater good for everyone but it is not something that can be uh, go uh, too too far next please so i uh, i'm saying that the challenges is quite clear yeah we have seen the examples of how it actually play a good role and a good part in actually discussing about the identity politics this is something that uh, really in a good uh, sense and very crucial matter on how we see how visual integrity also deal with the identity policy or go with or using the identity politics uh, to have its own uh, agenda propaganda in the society and also about digital and visual literacy as well as i have said before the digital gap has play uh, has been uh, a, a good way to look at how indonesia have problems with this uh, because of the gap and the, the digital literacy as well and especially visual literacy in understanding visual it is something that very crucial happen and further we see that in by next year we will have indonesia will have general election and used to be used as a warfare battleground yeah, for people especially on uh, social media on the internet on visual and virtual channels to exercise the power and further use as a uh, as a power tool to uh, put people on different direction and used to be based on the group's uh, kind of interest and become smaller because it is used for political purpose so this is uh, something that uh, i can give yeah uh, further I, i will have my final notes please Uh, that social media platforms uh, it is have been called upon to implement stricter content it's supposed to be like that the provider the producer uh, use more and invest in ai and human moderation educate users about the importance of verifying the authenticity of visual content before sharing it and maintaining visual integrity is an ongoing challenge in the digital age and it is ongoing ongoing and it is requires that effort of both platform providers and uses to combat in misinformation and deceptive practices it is strongly uh, uh, suggested because we are having this society growing and growing in terms of access on the internet but not growing in terms of the literacy of the content itself especially on the visual uh, visual visual, uh, visual channels so that's for me uh, thank you very much right we will continue further uh, with the discussion and uh, Harik, uh, are you still there? Can you uh, yes. put your video on so we can uh, see you from here? Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, round is up. Uh, we are having time for Q and A, Q and A for about 20 minutes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, terima kasih. Tapi saya akan menggunakan bahasa Indonesia. Tidak apa-apa. Oke. Okay. Uh, Nama saya Muni. Saya ingin uh, ingin mendiskusikan bagaimana tantangan hari ini dengan uh, new uh, me, apa, media yang baru ini ya. Karena uh, saya sebagai fotografer dokumenter ini juga menjadi <coughs> sebuah tantangan yang besar karena uh, saya pun mengalami uh, <coughs> uh, seakan-akan media hari ini adalah keterbukaan terlalu bebas tetapi padahal tidak juga misalnya ketika uh, beberapa karya yang misalkan saya, yang saya kerjakan mengenai rifuji uh, yang ada di Indonesia ketika saya mengupload uh, di Instagram atau di YouTube itu ditolak diblokir bahkan email saya har, apa uh, Google Drive saya langsung di di hack dalam dalam waktu yang bersamaan Jadi uh, itu itu bicara tentang refugi, belum lagi bicara tentang imigran yang lain dan isu-isu politik, uh, isu-isu kemanusiaan yang bicara tentang Papua dan lain-lainnya. Dan di sini uh, saya sadari bahwasanya uh, berarti media hari ini seakan-akan uh, hanya memberikan atau menampilkan isu-isu yang uh, yang menurut 
uh, mereka ya lebih baik itu yang dipublish tetapi isu-isu penting dalam arti bicara tentang kemanusiaan tentang uh, tentang yang harus diketahui dengan cara darurat itu tidak bisa kita di uh, kita dikontrol dengan itu gitu loh nah itu pertama dan kedua uh, mungkin nanti gimana ini cara menghadapi ini ya uh, saya saya butuh diskusi itu saya uh, saya sebagai pelaku jurnalis uh, jurnal, di dunia jurnalistik hari ini itu yang menjadi tantangan yang paling besar dan sebagai uh, uh, pembawa pesan ketika hari ini uh, uh, peminat berita itu juga semakin <laughs> apa tergeser berkurang karena dibatasi dengan durasi dua, dua menit bayangkan ketika kita membuat proyek dokumentari dengan pendekatan bahkan tahunan misalkan saya mengerjakan satu proyek lima tahun terakhir saya mengerjakan refugee saya harus merapatkan atau memberi ma, apa, memberikan durasi yang hanya dua menit eh, agar masyarakat kita bisa menerima itu 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 menjadi tantangan lagi saya sebagai misalkan saya sebagai fotografer gitu nah ini yang menjadi uh, saya juga pengen sharing kepada uh, kawan-kawan yang uh, seperti yang di apakah juga mengalami seperti itu di di, di negaranya dia seperti itu oke okay, thank you oke okay, uh, I will try to translate ya yeah. uh, what uh, ya yeah. what Muni uh, uh, was trying to say uh, first point yeah Muni is uh, talking uh, about uh, 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 she's a photojournalist yeah she's talking about when uh, she would like to um, upload his uh, her work on website on website Instagram or YouTube it uh, usually banned and uh, or, or, or what you call it, uh, played uh, as uh, something that uh, against the uh, rules, yeah? yeah. yeah. Okay, and it used to be written uh, on the on their uh, website, yeah, on social media, yeah, said that this content is disturbing, you cannot upload this. So she has this issue, but actually it is original, yeah? It is something that produced by herself. Yeah, but on social media, when uh, she try to upload it on Instagram, is it through the uh, uh, through the uh, your your uh, company, your news agency? No, uh, In, individual, personal. Yeah, the personal, the personal project. Hmm. Okay. Okay, the news content cannot be uh, uploaded because some countries cannot uh, uh, accept this kind of news or, or the photograph, yeah. Do you have something uh, in your uh, knowledge yeah, or experience about this and how to avoid this? That's the first question. Maybe Henry also can, can uh, respond on to this. Uh, the second one is uh, how uh, to uh, respond to the change, yeah that actually current uh, current society only attract to something that instant and just like unlimited uh, time frame yeah so for only two minutes information can be supply of uh, all of it yeah but as you know that it is something that to be processed further so that's the second question okay. please thank you, thank you. <laughs> well you you said so long that i i lost my i, I thought that's not for me <laughs> Anyway, I, I have, uh, I think I have better answer f to the second one, but for the first one, I think I will, I will say that uh, uh, in many instances, uh, actually, I have the situation, I'll tell you about that. I created my series soon to be gone, and it was quite funny because when I sent uh, to one uh, magazine and they published uh, like a selection of 10 images from my story, and I know what you're working on because we just talked with Eka. But uh, in my situation, it's just sentimental uh, things and sentimental pictures. And very often it's very uh, subjective. 
So, but there was one picture that had a naked chicken, like without feathers. <laughs> so, so Instagram put the blur on this image because I can't, un I can't believe we live in the world where you go to supermarket and you see hundreds, thousands of chickens slaughtered in the factories and we are okay with this. And we are not okay with the image which is grandmother's chicken prepared for the first, like, uh, for the birthday, which was plucked by her hands, taken, well, the, 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 the head was taken by her as well, but the chicken lived amazing life, and it's plucked in the picture, and it can't be shown, because it's Instagram. So, it's it's, it's joke, uh, it's ironic, and uh, I, I, I just want to say that for certain themes maybe you work on, I don't think there's a way to avoid this. The only thing to avoid this, I think, is to build the platform yourself and just ha somehow use social media to direct it to. So, for example, I, I'm not sure if I can uh, quickly show it, but uh, I showed you a um, series, uh, The Snows of Yesteryear, about Siberian Exile. And actually, for example, I can't show these images of archive of the children's deaths. Uh, there were some archival images of uh, children's uh, in caskets, and they're dead. So they are burying their children. But I can't show these pictures sometimes uh, because it's not like not 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 the visual content uh, social media would want. And maybe I would not want to put this on. Uh, just to show it straight away. So, for example, for my project, but which is long and which I worked on few years, I built a website which was dedicated for that. It had visuals, it had sounds, it had maps, it had uh, archival images, it, ha it, it had uh, portrait images of these people I photographed. But it was my own website, technically not my por portfolio website, but dedicated website for this work. So maybe the only way to avoid it is uh, to build some sort of platform that would be used as your own media outlet and then to use social media to direct it. Now this image that you will show may, may not be as uh, strong and not as explicit. Uh, that's the only way I can think about. But I'm not a photojournalist. That's another issue. My my work is very often more into brighter side of things, even though I talk about disappearance of villages, which is a sad moment for me, but still I make it as a um, kind of ray of light instead of darkness in there. So, uh, and another question, I think it was about the... I'm trying to remember. Yes, oh yes, uh, actually I wanted to talk about this, but I think the 15 minutes was not enough for me. So uh, I have this really good understanding of making, not, uh, not working on current issues. Actually, I would never work on current issues if, if it's uh, editorial uh, work that I need to produce and I know the story that goes maybe, that's another thing. But as a, an author, I would never take current issues. Uh, what I always think about is that, for example, and I'll tell you an example of that. Uh, uh, once again, we can talk about this uh, exhibition, uh, not exhibition, but a series of about the uh, Siberian exile. So I did this series in 2019-2021. Now, it's not current issue. It was Siberian exile was discussed and talked, and you know it's almost for us it's almost like stop stop talking about that because it's too much. Now I started to do the series because it was my own intention and my own way of trying to analyze this whole situation, trying to find a new angle, and because I th I thought it's my uh, as I said it it was some sort of inner voice that said to do that, and how ironic is that in 2022 Siberian exile starts to happen once again with Ukrainian people so what happened actually before I before even the actual war in Ukraine started I did the series that were almost like the same process 70 years ago that happens now and suddenly your work becomes very very important 
And in, in October, in uh, European Union uh, headquarters, this uh, exhibition will be held. And uh, actually, I will, I will try to use my voice just to explain to people that, look, 70 years ago we said never again, and now it's happening. But my work before the current issue, why I'm saying b b before the current issue, because I was not reflecting on the war. I was reflecting of my inner voice that took me to something s very sadly started to happen in 2022. So uh, I would suggest you, I know it's sometimes that's how people work because they look for current issues and reflect on that. But there's a problem with this because when you want to do very, very good job, you can't do that in a week. You need to do that for months, sometimes for years. Now, suddenly, someone comes to the uh, newspaper and spreads the same story that you had, but not as good. The problem is, you could do it better, but you'll do it later. So, who cares later? Because no one will be interested. And the s person that did it already, not so good, actually, he's the one that did it first, or she's the one that did it first. So, avoiding current issues is always a very good reason. So maybe when you think about the themes that you can work on it's very often to think maybe this theme at least can be reflected somehow that it would not be almost like um, typical to what someone else would do so if it's if it's I exile like i did i would tell story about 10 children instead of the whole uh, genocide so for example in your history it would be like something very very specific uh, I think that's that's the way I would suggest, but it doesn't answer maybe your question how to how to avoid it. I would say just um, think deeper in how you can show visually this, uh, or be very quick. <laughs> that's the only thing actually you can do. Thank you, uh, Henrik. Do you have any comment? Uh, yes, a very. I uh, just wanted to add regarding the question about uh, the censorship, where the stuff you put on Instagram was deleted. I want to uh, express my support. I think it's uh, it's very uh, terrible that you upload something and then the platform decides, oh, whatever, we don't want it, we don't need it, we don't allow it. This is sadly the re reality. Instagram is a privately owned company, so they have their own rules. Mm. And also, regarding uh, depending on in which country they operate, they sometimes also have different rules. But it's all it's all a black box. It's a, it's closed source. It's not open source. So this is a problem we can't really solve we, because it's not democratic. It's a private decision. Um, I have some slight hope. Um, in the last months, um, the EU um, Parliament um, became a little spark of hope for me personally because they they uh, set up laws that forces the tech giants to to be more open. Like for example, a couple of days ago, Apple released iPhone 15 with USB-C. <laughs> they wouldn't have done it if the EU wouldn't have forced them. Mm. And also, there's a rumor that. Um, Meta, the WhatsApp um, company or Instagram company, they are uh, having a beta test of um, cross-platform interoperability between WhatsApp and other messengers, maybe. So they're at least testing it. And I think they're only doing it because in some time in the future they might have to in Europe. Um, and something more tangible, more helpful, maybe, um, please check out a website. It's called uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. It's EFF. And also please check out um, the Freedom of the Press Foundation. And those are two websites where you can um, learn more about privacy issues and uh, censorship issues and how to avoid it. Okay, Henry. Thank you. Uh, I want to add uh, also about uh, having this uh, situation, yeah, where the two minutes uh, video uh, are more likable, yeah. But I also know, and also one of my students have this uh, research on uh, social, uh, on YouTube video that actually the title is 
two hours doing nothing and it's for two hours video with some people just sit down and the viewers is around 800,000 <laughs> so I think uh, it is uh, maybe it is something not only related with the content also the length yeah, but also about the intri intriguing title as well yeah so uh, if you we would like to go with the flow like uh, the viral kind of uh, content uh, viral uh, title or if you have this uh, uh, capital uh, letter kind of uh, title maybe it will help and also having this uh, uh, the keywords that uh, people use to type yeah and it can uh, go through on your on your uh, uh, content i think it was also will be also helpful in terms of understanding that there are range of audience that maybe not go into the stream but also they have this kind of uh, uh, situation that they would like to be as an avant-garde as possible yeah and also uh, the uh, uh, community like journalism without border i think it can be also become one of your uh, 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 access yeah, to this kind of uh, community that you all already have your content is having its own uh, viewer audience that is very typical and it's also maybe so unique yeah, right now because we are having this study on this how unique the audience uh, is actually yeah not only through this uh, go on based on the stream not only like that but also uh, become very unique in terms of audience Ya itu ya ya emang itu salah satu trik ya mungkin hari ini triknya adalah ketika kita membuat judul yang menarik sehingga uh, viewers lebih banyak dan pada akhirnya kita harus mengorbankan standar jurnalistik itu jadi hari ini uh, jurnalistik akhirnya bukannya semakin maju semakin berkembang tapi kemunduran nah ini yang menjadi tantangan yeah, tersendiri yeah. nih. Yeah, uh, she pointed out about the quality of the journalism if we go with the stream. Yeah, like think more about the title, not the content. So it is something that become a challenge for journalism. Yes, thank you. All right, an another from the audience, if you have any comment on this or from online audience, if you, uh, it's only three of us here. Please. Karen, if you have something to say. No? Oh, yeah. Or uh, Jerome? Yeah. No, I have, I have not a lot, but the, the when you when you show the you find the, the, the image of with the sticker, I was thinking to um, an artist, in fact, maybe you know Barbara Kruger, which the the, the work is to to, to to just to reappropriation of image, and she just put message. So it's an artist from the 70s or something. Yeah. And she just used the same uh, typography than the famous Mark Supreme. Mm. And it's a subtle way to show our, our society and the relationship we have with our society. And when you show this image, I think it was very, very before the invention of the sticker. But artists maybe should have to to work on this on this way, and maybe maybe it's a way to to explain or to to understand the, the, the what, what what you what you what you like the saying. Like sticker culture, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thanks, thanks, Jerome, yeah. for that. Yeah, and it's growing. I think uh, the uh, the creativity of people in yeah. making uh, uh, the sticker is, I think, is growing, especially for young people. Please, Karen. Yeah, maybe I have another comment. It's more about uh, or referring to Tadas presentation because I thought you were focusing so much on this idea of subjectivity and you um, it seemed a bit that the idea of um, showing true interest into the subject you're working about or um, trying to be honest could be the clue to evolve a different way of storytelling and Actually, I'm not so sure about it, if, even if I appreciate the approach a lot, because I think maybe the traditional photojournalist would have been convinced of doing the same. So I'm asking myself, what really might be the difference? Difference, you know, if you, you are uh, up to 
developing new ways of oh yes storytelling or but i'm not that's exactly what i'm saying i'm i'm not trying to develop i'm exactly the right uh, exactly the type of human that would uh, appreciate the old ways of photography mm -hmm. it's exactly my point and by doing so what i just wanted to say is that by doing so you can still be creating in your own ways but it's not the it's not the media it's not the it's not the image you show it's basically the story you would tell and i think the only thing i can be creative in is for example exhibiting this work that's another story so for example i was rushing through a presentation i thought it's not enough time but just for example when you do pres uh, when you do exhibitions then you can start to be creative on like multi-layering this so for example when i did the um, exhibition on these uh, siberian exiles what i did i would always ask them to sh uh, to take with themselves s uh, one thing that they would take when they were orphans and going back in 1946 back uh, there was something that reminded them um, like uh, uh, their mother's cross or their uh, painting of, of, of uh, her friends. Uh, so by, but by doing that, I'm not saying that it's something new and something unexplored. I'm just saying that subjectivity becomes like an intertwined tapestry of things and it just becomes um, close to someone's heart and just very sentimental. And by this, you are more prone for the um, l lie. I don't know how to explain this, but it's like you you become more true, and you become almost like explaining to your close one about your other close one. So it's like it it, it becomes like very very uh, close and nice for you, and and emotional and sentimental. And by this, I'm just uh, have this idea of like integrity is almost like uh, just believing in truth and just trying to um, avoid any way of lie but by telling it by your own is the only way to do that and but but uh, answering your question i think your comment is that i'm exactly the person that would not look into the new ways of telling stories i really so much love how photography was and I really like so much how people were very often so closely uh, getting into the themes that they love. And for example, when I analyzed Lithuanian uh, Lithuanian school of photography, what I was most amazed is that when I see right now very often in photojournalism is that photojournalists forget to work their love themes. When I say love themes is the one that they would carry on because of their own sake, of their own story of their own, uh, uh, like we talked with Gaia and she has a story about her family. Uh, I talk with many other uh, uh, colleagues, they, they have something, but very, very often, nine of 10 photojournalists very often don't have this. So they lose themselves in this like very, very quick uh, world that actually needs to be about current issues. Uh, in Lithuanian School of Photography, it was very typical for someone to have their love theme that would carry on like 15 years or like 20 years. And by this, they are not trying to be creative at all, but just they, they love to love the human that was photographed. And when you see images of uh, uh, Gordon Parks, for example, like wonderful images from uh, American South, that you, can, you see these images and you just uh, start to love these people so much because you can feel the actual photographer's input into that. And when I see images like that and the uh, works of uh, Dorothea Lange or I don't know, uh, Walker Evans maybe is not a good example. I'm very in love with American photography or like uh, documentary photography. When I see these images, it reminds me Lithuanian School of Photography and it reminds me of Robert, uh, Robert Doineau uh, works from France. Sometimes it's sentimental and a bit sweet, but I, 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 I think we are so in, uh, tangled uh, in trying to be popular, interesting, that we forget the actual photography's own point of photography is for humans that we photograph. So actually it's a love, ma <laughs> it sounds strange, but for me it's love making, the second of love making with the person you photograph. If you don't have it uh, with them, uh, basically 
you are not convinced yourself you will do good photography. So whatever I do, I, I don't try to be creative. I just try to be honest and true. So n n there was no intention of me telling about new media. That's the thing. No, it, it, yeah, I wasn't referring to new media, actually. Yeah. I, d I was just kind of getting a bit suspicious about this idea of subjectivity, uh -huh. even o if on one hand I yes. completely agree with you uh -huh. that it is th maybe the only chance we have because we all know now that objectivity is not possible. But I think you can also be misled a lot by your own yes. feeling of being subjective because you are yes. influenced by so many things and you know it might feel like you're completely in it yes. you feel you're doing uh, you're very honest but i know sometimes you don't know what kind of influences come into it and maybe of course of course and that's the work actually to prove it and i think the the only way to do that is to make it for a long time so basically you start to become like someone that is trusted. Uh, now we have this situation. Jan Grarov was trusted so much, and now he has a uh, political dropped him out, uh, him out because looks like he was faking few images from Ukraine. But uh, I, I'll come back to this. Actually, I want to add something else. Uh, maybe it was too quick when I was trying to explain, but. Um, uh, uh, this is why I think that photographers very much need to concentrate on their own countries because uh, that's the only way to be true, honest, still know the background, uh, not needing the fixer. So you are not like even, you are not even taken to the, let's say, to the situations that might be set up for you emotionally as well. But it's quite interesting that uh, sometimes we just lose this interest and we are not caring about it so much. So maybe subjectivity in my uh, understanding might be something subjective because you are born into that. So you can tell it very honestly. And uh, the, only, the only problem is uh, that we lose interest. So if you merge these things together, maybe it could work. So still it's 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 the same question of just true love to the story you tell the <laughs> yes I, i'm 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 sure we still have not answered uh, what what you wanted to say to me and maybe i didn't prove anything uh, by answering this question but i truly believe that's the that's 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 the good one of the good ways to work thank you for your comment please Jerome. So I, I have another question to to the dish, but more about about the photographic choice because we we speak about image, but we feel that you like very much photogra color photography and you have a lot of technical choice and a lot of you, you like the camera. You you're a photographer and that yes, we, we yes, feel this. We, we can avoid to speak about photography because we feel in your photography there very traditionally and very you like not to contrast image and i just a question about you your camera you choose cam immediate for my camera very frequently seems and square mm -hmm. is it for you a way to to keep the contact with your subject when you're taking photographs because we all know all photographs know that's special when you are behind you you find her it's not the same then you are just in I front of your subject and yes. with the camera. So just if you can say a few words about this, this very special things which is making pictures with the camera. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, well, it's a kind of question because I love to talk about technical <laughs> things as well. So it's, uh, I think it's one of these things you learn uh, through your life and uh, the first time, if I could tell about this uh, like whole story, how photography comes to you it's 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 such a beautiful process of falling in love with actual uh, materials you work with with silver paper and with a medium format camera and actually uh, talking about medium format cameras I think it's a, that's very special uh, tool because you look uh, through the image from the top you see it as a, almost like a slide in itself so y whatever you see it's all uh, framed Right now, I don't use it at the moment, but I, I try to work with other uh, other mm, cameras. But I believe uh, even though maybe I would now change the camera, 
I still know how to communicate with person because the medium format cameras could uh, have this an uh, un, uh, obtrusive way of connecting. And when you look at the person and actually when you keep your camera like that, it's always like very beautiful connection. Uh, now, there are a few other things which are very nice. Uh, very often camera uh, which is uh, next, and, and I say it intentionally, I might sound romantic, but actually you carry it next to your heart. It's like when you watch it, it's like close to your heart. So it's, 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 it's corny, but actually it is closer to your heart, not to your eye. Uh, but it, 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 gets, it gets this um, an expectancy for people as well. They somehow, uh, even though it sounds, uh, again, childish, they are interested in the process as much. And why I say so? Because I sometimes work with large format cameras. And I still do not understand one thing which is so common and which is why I believe subjectivity is so much important is that you can put multi-billion dollar person in front of certain thing and he becomes child again. Why I say so? We Now we build uh, one big story about uh, Jewish people that were uh, they, um, their ancestry was in Lithuania. It's called Litvax, uh, type uh, like some Jewish people are uh, descendants from Lithuania, from Vilna. And uh, we talked with a very, very important person, very rich and uh, very important personality. And on the same time, while I was working with large format camera, he was more excited about this than actually the actual talks uh, about his business, about everything else. But let's stay from large format camera, but I will tell you one thing which was so amazing is that we film with 8 millimeter black and white camera as well. You know, the one that... And as soon... Uh, he's, he's, I think, 75 or something like that. And as soon as that person, like the person you would never meet in the street, you would never have a talk with him, as soon as he saw 8 millimeters camera, he looked like that and waved. And that's, that's, that's what sentimentality gets you to, actually. Sen sentiment, sometimes they're a bit underrated right now because sometimes for some people it's corny and cheesy. And, but actually, how to open up the doors to the person that actually opened all the doors? You choose certain one small, small bit in your life, like, like eight mi millimeters camera, and suddenly, like in, uh, if you ever saw Ratatouille animation, it's the same when Ego tasted the actual uh, Ratatouille that took him to the actual childhood. And this man, with 8 millimeter camera, he was child again while his mother was filming him. So this is, this is why, why tools and why choosing of certain light and certain moments and certain stories, it's very important to everyone. This is why you, how you can connect with them so closely. <laughs> I extended the <laughs> question. Okay, maybe. thank you. Uh, and we run out of time. Uh, so thanks, Tadas, and thanks, Heinrich, as well, uh, who uh, came online, and thanks, everyone. Uh, we still have one more session, which is closing session, and the coffee is waiting for us outside. So let's uh, make this finish, and then we can go out for a coffee, okay? Uh, thank you, Tadas. Thanks, Andrew, as well. I will invite um, Mike to go uh, in front of us. And uh, also, uh, do you have Sandra over here? Not yet, yeah? Okay, just Mike then. Oh, Mbak Krishna is here? Oh, yeah, they're not, they're not uh, still on. So yeah, uh, thanks everyone So uh, for being here, still here in our last day uh, and also the, the commitment uh, to be here. I would like to conclude yeah, with uh, what we have experienced on the past two days. Uh, we have uh, a very great session 
yesterday uh, with uh, also a good opening that uh, many people coming especially uh, our invitation that uh, actually uh, distributed and everyone is coming and we are so glad about it uh, recording stopped the uh, opening started actually by the address uh, from the rector that represented by the vice rector of uh, research uh, professor ninyoman and also uh, the representative further uh, the, present the representative of the province uh, bapak beni and also uh, Mr. Jules Irman, the head of Institute Francais Indonesia, uh, also the representative of uh, Germany, uh, Bapak Christopher, yeah? uh, uh, and also uh, the Australian uh, Consul General, that presented by Medi, uh, Miss Medi. And uh, this has become a great proof that we are on uh, the good connection and the network with everyone. And also we uh, also uh, try to, uh, we address as well that uh, the uh, consul general, the representative from the uh, Japanese consul general also here uh, during uh, the opening session. After the opening, there are presentation. There were actually presentation from the 12 uh, re uh, resident uh, students and applause for them who still here also here, here yeah. And thanks for them for making this very intriguing, beautiful photographs yeah, that they produce during uh, the residency in Bromo for 12 days with uh, worth mentioning mentors as well. Uh, Professor Karen Jerome and also uh, uh, Papa Rio Helmi yeah, and also Oscar Motulo. And also we cannot forget how the hospitality of the uh, resort uh, management Pak uh, Bagas, Pak Sigit, and also the brothers, yeah, uh, Rio and other thing. Uh, and this is something that uh, we really appreciate uh, for the um, presentation that uh, also presented in a good way with different kind of uh, act yeah, uh, performed by the uh, students. And it was actually applauded by the uh, comments from uh, Ibu Yuliati Umrah uh, as uh, the uh, CEO of uh, Alit Foundation. Uh, she has addressed uh, community development in several areas, including in Bromo. And she also mentioning about many things about Bromo and appreciating what has been done by the workshop uh, residency participants. Uh, we also have uh, this. Uh, also, yeah, I'm, I'm, I forgot to mention Mas Aji, yeah, also become one of the mentors. Yeah. Mas Aji, still here, Mas Aji? Yeah, Masaji. Hello, Masaji. Thanks very much. And uh, after the presentation, we have a session uh, presented by Zhuang Wubin, uh, Professor Paniza Almak, and also uh, uh, Oscar Motulo. Uh, the uh, different point of view, uh, like Zhuang Wubin, uh, put the presentation on photography and Chinese in Indonesia. I think it, it intrigues many people to understand different community that live in Indonesia and how it can be represented through photography. Uh, and also uh, Professor Paniza Almak uh, on photography feminine has put also uh, someone in tears <laughs> because remembering about the situation that maybe uh, not uh, become famous in uh, Europe but in Asia, especially in Indonesia, it's still hard to be a uh, female photographer, work on streets, uh, but without, uh, and also with this kind of um, challenges uh, from the society and how they try to uh, understand their self, uh, themselves yeah, as a photographer. And also Pa Oscar Motulo uh, on his presentation about the theater of identity debris and exploration of post-truth photography in Indonesia has uh, uh, put the cases on how Indonesia through photographs that he himself has been part of the history. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, I think it is uh, quite intriguing in terms of the discussion because uh, later yesterday uh, we also have presentation from Jerome Jaha, from Jerome about the images of, of from Belfast, otherness and transformation of European city with different panelists, yeah, from Oscar, uh, Panitza, Gaia, and Tadas, moderated by uh, Pak Aji, has discussed about the issue from different perspective, and that marks the day one. And uh, the day one has also been concluded uh, by 
uh, the uh, dinner yeah that uh, uh, established uh, last night at the 17th floor where people not i think there's still not enough time uh, to speak uh, and discuss one another uh, but i heard that the students residency students have party of the night yeah by doing karaoke with mas ipung yeah <laughs> and that's so good where was it at happy puppy yeah that's so good yeah uh, 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 to have fun yeah in surabaya while you can yeah <laughs> I heard that you sing dangdut as well, yeah? Yeah, that's very good. And uh, the second day, uh, today, we are uh, doing this from, a mo uh, from a nine, yes, yeah? start from nine with the presentation from uh, Dr. Zaki Habibi, who uh, share about the visual methodology that actually become very important in understanding visual products in current situation with the title of sensory photography, photo documentation, photo elicitation and photography for investigating social issue. Uh, he also discussing about the, uh, how it can be used to uh, look at the photography not only from what it, ha uh, it has been seen but also from the image symbols that uh, appear on the photography itself. And also with Gaia Squarsi from Italy on images, new media and reality, uh, moderated by Anga Prawadika, discuss more about how the role of new media can actually uh, uh, being uh, uh, put into the consideration into how society using social media, using new media as well, as part of their uh, interactivity and also their uh, discussion and communications through uh, visual images. We have a long break actually because here in uh, Surabaya, uh, people, uh, some people do uh, Friday prayer. Uh, so it's quite long, but it's also good uh, for networking again, uh, for lunch, yeah, uh, and also to discuss uh, with many people. I think the one that most important is about the networking and also friendship here, right? And we discuss further this uh, afternoon, yeah, uh, with uh, uh, Tadas, with Heinrich uh, from Lithuania and Germany, and also with me, uh, with different uh, kind of perspective. The first one, Tadas, uh, has uh, his presentation on subjectivity as a tool for visual integrity in the digital era, and Heinrich is about the artificial intelligence, the human labor behind the human interface. And also me, we discuss about visual integrity and social media in contemporary Indonesia in the topic of visual integrity in digital era, gender, culture, ethics, and identity. And we have a very good discussion, especially what has been uh, discussed further about the subjectivity and also how a uh, sticker culture can be put special role and especially a question raised by one of the uh, participants about how uh, photojournalism uh, on this uh, era uh, are, are facing different challenges as well. And we are f uh, right now heading on uh, our final uh, session uh, and this is something that I think uh, very important to uh, thank uh, different partners that actually make this uh, occasion happen. And uh, I would like to give the time especially for the uh, main organizer from Wisma German and also Ifi Surabaya. Uh, but uh, uh, if we Surabaya representatives, I think they're still on a meeting, so uh, we'll give the time first to Mike from Wisma German. Please, Mike. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is my my pleasure um, to give this closing remarks here in the name of uh, Wisma German and also Ifi. But at the same time, it is also a bit sad um, that this two-day colloquium already is coming to an end. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, with today's contributions by our speakers and the moderator, um, we ended this uh, two-day event on a high note. Um, the same way as it started yesterday um, with the recap of the students' uh, workshop experience. And uh, Mas Irfan already uh, gave a good recapitulation about uh, everything that happened during the last two days. Uh, 
we all could witness some highly interesting presentations uh, on photography um, about the role of the photographer and um, about different approaches and techniques on how to help tell a story. But also we heard that pictures themselves uh, can be used to tell a certain narrative um, and that the same picture can be used to tell a different and even conflicting narrative or story. But uh, what is more, I think the last two days also uh, brought many opportunities uh, to network, to get to know each other. Um, we invited people uh, with similar interests and backgrounds and therefore I think uh, this colloquium enabled a fruitful exchange and uh, Hopefully, that is our sincere hope and our wish um, that it can lay the groundwork for future continued exchange between all the participants and also enable future uh, collaboration. I would also like to thank everyone who was present um, during the last two days and in particular all the different institutions that were involved um, in the organization and in the preparation of this event um, who and who have worked very hard during the last month um, to make this project and this event a reality. Yeah, <laughs> applause for everyone. So I would like to express my gratitude, of course, to Universitas Erlanga um, and the whole uh, UNER team who worked on this colloquium and did an amazing job uh, with this uh, event. Pa Irfan, Ibu Intan, Mas Irfai, and everyone else who I cannot name everyone, but uh, who was connected with the organization. I think they did a really great job. And uh, thank you very much also to all the other partners from Indonesia, Germany, and France. Um, who in long and frequent online sessions um, contributed with their ideas and input uh, to the conception and the planning of this colloquium. The uh, Hannover University of Applied uh, Sciences and Arts, um, Ostkreuzschule Berlin, uh, who is represented by two students, I think, yeah. Um, then also uh, Goblin School, and uh, not to forget uh, Padebukan Bromo School of Photography and uh, EC Jogjakarta. Thank you to all the speakers uh, who contributed offline and online, and uh, who joined us during the last two days, some of you who traveled uh, from far away. Yeah. Um, and also a thank you to, fr from my side, thank you to uh, our friends and colleagues from EFI um, who shouldered a large part of the work um, during the last weeks uh, because of my private circumstances. <laughs> um, and it was uh, an absolute pleasure for all of us to work together on this project. Um, we hope we will have uh, further collaborations and we will continue this uh, work on this uh, photography topic in the future. And uh, from now on, we will continue with the next stage of the project, uh, the exhibition that will showcase the workshop results, uh, the work of the 12 students who participated in the in the workshop residency at the Bromo, and also the documentation of their experience. Um, <laughs> so, and uh, having seen how fast this group uh, grew clo close together and has bonded, um, I'm looking forward to this last stretch of the project and to see their works and uh, the workshop documentation presented in a uh, in a format that will even more enhance and support the results. So we, l we look forward to that. Um, I would like to end my closing remarks with a citation from today's presentations that stuck with me. 
um, regarding to visual integrity and the use of new imagery in new media. Do not accept reality as you perceive it or maybe as shown in the picture. Um, I think we have learned during the last two days that this has been true since the dawn of photography and even before that. Um, but as was also underlined by Irfan's uh, presentation. This is especially true in uh, today's society where it is hard to distinguish between what is real and what isn't. I feel we can take from this event that it is something that we need to teach the youth to always be critical, to dig deeper and to ask questions in order to gain a better understanding of reality. And with this, I would end my closing remarks. Thank you all for being with us for the last two days. Have a great afternoon, and hopefully see you again next year. Thank you. OK, uh, so uh, by the end of the speech by Mike, I also ended uh, our uh, colloquium, Mike. Yeah, and also thanks everyone for being here. And we still have time uh, for uh, for chats, yeah, networking, because uh, already uh, supplied for coffee and tea, and also the snacks, yeah, outside. Thank you again, everyone. And uh, I think we should uh, close this with the group photo, yeah. Okay. So everyone, uh, I invite you to come uh, in front and also take a group photo. <laughs>